All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is November 6th, 2023, but you won't be seeing this until the evening of November 7th. I'm just filming in advance. That's all I'm doing. I have the time, as you're going to find out why. And um, yeah, today we're going to go into some things, um, some some fun things, some interesting, some telling things. Um, as I get started, I'm also going to um, tell a little bit about what's been happening with me the last uh, almost three weeks. There's a reason for it. There's a, there's a, a story with it that I think uh, will affect and touch some of you as well. That's why I'm telling it, um, as well as what brought me out of it. So we're going to show a, a video clip that I saw that that helped bring me out of it on Saturday evening, started to change my prayer life, uh, make some a little adjustments um, in my evening prayers that began on Saturday. And then what I read on Sunday morning, I woke up and you guys know I hang out in my garage. That's where uh, uh, I have my study in there and everything else where I do my videos from. And I started reading into a book within the 54 books, uh, uh, the 54 book Apocrypha and going into the books that Polycarp wrote. He has one called the Epistle of Polycarp and the other the other one called uh, the Martyrdom of Polycarp. And we're going to briefly look through two those two books that he wrote in tonight's video. And and I'm going to explain something that touched me to the core when I read it and put a stop to everything that I was in the midst of doing. But I was doing it with truth and with with purpose. But it was a distraction. And I knew it and I was fighting it for almost three weeks. So I'm going to explain to you what happened, why. And then I'm going to share just what's in Polycarp, what affected me, and some incredible is-to-come insight within Polycarp as well. Um, then we're going to connect that to the timeline. I had a brother uh, request that I should maybe redo the timeline chart. The The chart is good. It's all done. It's it's all updated. It has been for a few months. Um, but then bring it into the timeline chart and break the timeline chart down. And so what I'm going to do is it's just going to flow all into one video, but anybody who wants just the timeline chart and be able to share it in a breakdown with people, I'm going to put it in, in a breakdown in the description box. And for those in the forum, after the video goes live, um, uh, so tomorrow night or, or Wednesday morning, it'll be in the forum, but it will be in the description box in under this video as well. So if you wanted to share just the portion to others, of the timeline or leave it with your leave behind materials, it will be in the description box, just that segment of tonight's teaching and video. So with that, let's get started as I always do. You know, this, it's a ministry, it's called ministry revealed for a reason. Did I know that when it started? Absolutely not. It was just the wording that came to my thoughts as I was pondering what to name the video. And lo and behold, six years later, here we are with all of these hundreds upon hundreds of incredible revelations, the books having opened. So much so, you're going to see something within Polycarp that he said he wasn't even given, but that another group was. It's awesome. It is so jam-packed in Polycarp. There's some nerve-wracking stuff in what he talks about, but there's some great stuff too. And I'm going to connect it to scriptures. And like I said, I'll lead that into uh, the timeline chart as well. So, um, as always, I like to start by letting everybody know if you're new to the channel and you're on YouTube, come to this playlist link right here. And in this playlist, watch the first four videos. The first one is about 22 minutes. The second and the third are about 30 minutes. They're all Bible studies. And then the fourth is a big one, about two hours and 45 minutes, tying all together how these revelations were missed because what you're going to find out are things you have never heard of before. The other place you can go is to our website here. This is ministryrevealed.com. You can go to the menu box. You can click the intro. And from the intro, the first four videos that come up on this page are the same as the first four videos in that playlist. And here it is. This is that first 22 minute intro. You can download it or watch it. It's a simple one-click download if you want to save it. 
or you can just watch it right here from the website. It breaks down what the next three videos are about, gives a little bit of insight as to what you're gonna see. This is the first 30 minute video. And in this video, you're gonna see that these differences within the gospels, if you have ever read the gospels, which I hope you have, if you're here, you'll know that, that there's these differences all throughout them, especially the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Well, it turns out, when this all began for me in September of 2017, it began with the revelation of these differences in the Gospels being revealed. It's the number one piece that has to be understood to clearly understand what is coming in prophecy like it has never been understood before. You'll see that these differences in the Gospels are all prophecy. Then as you scroll down, and it's going to blow your mind, and this is only a 30-minute Bible study, so we're not going crazy deep into it. Just to give you some simple pieces within these differences and let you see for yourself before you go and dig deeper. What you'll come to understand from that is when you understand that the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the end, the first will be last, the last will be first, means Luke, Mark, and Matthew, you'll realize that even their discourses are clearly different for a reason. With all of the differences within the wording, there's a reason for it. It is not just that Matthew, Mark, and Luke and all those discourses, uh, they're just the same with different perspective. Absolutely not. You're going to realize that Luke's pertains to the pre, Mark's is the seven years of seals, Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets. And this is what you'll begin to understand. Once you begin to understand the differences in the Gospels, you will begin to see that the end of days is not seven years, but 14 years in a small portion called above. This is, again, a 30-minute Bible study just to lay out some foundational, simple points of it to help you see it and understand it. This one, it's all because of Matthew, is a big one. This one is about, like I said, about two hours and 45 minutes long. And the reason for it is it delves into all of these differences in, in not only the Gospels, but what it was that caused us to only see seven years. And the reason is just like the title says, it's all because of Matthew. We have all for hundreds and hundreds of years have all been taught from the gospel perspective of Matthew. And everything else is just told to us as like perspective. So when you go to look at the end of days, you're not seeing Mark and you're not seeing the small portion of Luke's. What you do is you're seeing, while well, you're seeing them, but you don't know how they fit. And so you stick them all into the Matthew seven-year perspective. That's why there's confusion. That's why nobody knows pre, mid, or post, and they debate it and they argue it and there's division because of it. Well, when you realize the differences in the gospels, the 14 years and above, and that it's all because of the perspective of Matthew, you'll realize that pre, mid, and post are all true. And we reveal it here in this ministry. So that's the, the opener that I always like to go into with people. Then you can go into the deeper stuff here from the website. This is a three-hour teaching on the differences in the Gospels. Here's the differences in the discourses revealed in the above, the seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, showing the typologies of pre, mid, and post and the triumphal entry, the transfiguration, the resurrection, and many more places. And then it just keeps going and going and going. The mystery of the seven churches revealed. It is all here for you to check out. You can do that from the playlist or you can do it here from ministryrevealed.com. So with that, let me get into what it was that, um, that I was going through. And many of you guys <laughs> probably have had noticed along the way uh, the past couple months or so, I've been a little bit kind of bummed a little bit disappointed and, and down because ever since I've made known that I believe it's not that the pre-trib doesn't happen until true Feast of Weeks in 2024, which I believe is August 12th, um, so many people, half the people essentially have stopped watching. And and it hurts, right? So you guys have heard me talk about that. I mean, look, at it was right before this video right here. And then look at that afterwards. All of it's dropped by half. You see, it's all really slowed down. And, and having worked on bringing about the revelation for these past six years and sharing with everybody the spirit leads, it, 
it really it it hurt. It was disappointing. It was disheartening. But I still have the rest of you guys, right? There's still everybody else who are the ones really seeking and searching these things out. But it still had an effect, obviously, on me. And so I started wandering in other things I can maybe do to occupy my time. And I know that this could have an effect on on maybe helping others that are pondering these things and um, maybe just help some people out with it because this is what I do full time. And because I have some time to be able to do other things, I thought, you know what? With half the people, half the the watch now taking place, um, there's less support coming in. So what am I going to do with less support? I'm not really able to now uh, do what we were doing and to be able to send, you know, a significant amount of support to Uganda. Our bills are still, you know, getting starting to get backed up again. I keep pushing them back. And, you know, I know that this comes with ministry. And um, but I've always wanted to get my debts paid. And so I started focusing on, hey, what can I do to, number one, be debt free, which is honorable with the Lord. And number two, along the way, help support more people within the ministry and their needs, and in particular, Uganda, to really grow it where, where it's just he can use all the help that he can get to grow it. And of course, that generally comes by support. And if I was able to get this funding, I would be able to pay my debts and bang, I'd be able to go to Uganda and I would spend a couple of weeks there at a time and uh, really help them out and, and just go to all these churches that are asking for me. And so... I started thinking, well, why don't I start something on the side? And so for the last just about three weeks, I've been working. I was working on something. Um, many of you guys know I come from a real estate background, uh, investment real estate. And I created um, um, a form, a, a strategy back in 2005. I've never shared it. Only my lawyers and uh, my lawyer at the time and a broker that I use knows about this strategy. And so I thought, man, I could really help a lot of people really benefit and be able to get into um, the real estate industry and really start making money with it very quickly. And so I thought, you know what? Why don't I build something around that? And so I started looking into all sorts of things. I got a website, great website name for it. Uh, was putting it all together, the the study notes to teach it, do all of these things. But I was in a struggle the whole way through. Was it because I thought I was doing something um, deceitful or not honorable with the Lord? Absolutely not. Because I wasn't going to stop doing this. I was going to still keep doing this as I do every four to five days, bang a video, um, um, in communication with people in the forum and so forth. And so I thought, why not? I have the time. And I don't know if you know how business works, many of you, but it'll start to eat up a lot of your time, even though once it's established, I can it wouldn't take as much time. I knew in my heart that I was dividing myself. And I know that this is my calling, that this ministry is absolutely 100 percent my calling and that regardless of. The, the the support slowing down and half of the viewership and, and all of these things because people either disappointed in, in having to wait another year, not wanting to believe it or whatever the case may be, and, and that weighing on me, that's part of the ministry. And so I, you know, I thought I was going to be able to do it. And I knew, though, as I said, that this is this is what I do. This is I know as many of you guys know, that I was anointed to do this. This is the revelation of the open book, guys. And I have explained this many times. I've talked about it many times. This, I, I get disappointed at the, not the core of the people, not, not half the people, but probably the ones that have just shown themselves to be the ones looking for a date. You know, it's easy to pull back and say, OK, well, we're still watching, Lord. We're still doing what we need to do. And that's great. That's what we should all be doing, regardless if you're watching these videos or not. But there, there's always this core in the ministry, whether it's a thousand, fifteen hundred or whatever, that that are watching, that are diligent, that are still participating and, and staying close with the Lord. But 
you know, it's uh, the disappointment comes from knowing that there's such a large group that we're watching that have stopped watching that I feel maybe not all of them, but many of them have pulled away in the sense of not realizing what they've been given to understand. And that's what really uh, pokes at me because what we've been given is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is his revelation. This is the revelation of his is to come being revealed through us here in this ministry. And my number one thing that I have ever always wanted to do was reach more. And so you can understand in always wanting to reach more, all of a sudden it's reaching half as many. Now you can see the 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 hurt that I was in. I don't blame those people, but I don't understand how people can come to understand these things and then just walk away and go listen and go do whatever else they want. This, th this is the revelation. This is a mystery that has been hidden since the foundations of the earth. These are mysteries that were that were kept secret till the time of the end. That's how powerful it is. And that's why the, the core of us, all we want to do is reach more people. And so I went down that path and I started doing it until Saturday night. And what happened on Saturday night was this. I had been pondering it for, like I said, for about, well, not even pondering it. I had pondered it for a little bit and... And I was coming from the wrong place, if you right, really, because I wasn't coming from it from, hey, the ministry is going great. Let's kick it up a notch and let me see what I can do to to help take it to the next level. No, I was coming from the side of of what can I do, Lord? I can't. What, what can I do to have more support come in? The only thing I can think of is to put it into my own hands. Let me take control of it then and I'll go do something else. And help support the ministry to be able to do these things. I can't put the burden on everybody else. So what can I do? And with this knowledge, I thought that's what I would do. But I was still torn. I had prayed every single night over it. And, and you know how prayers go, right? A lot of times, I mean, the prayers are always like, Lord, please, Lord, please, Lord, will you show me something, right? We, we all have these prayers and we all know these prayers. And so this was posted on Saturday. Actually, I posted it in the forum. For those that, when you hear me talk about the forum, I'm talking about here on the website. You can come down to here, the forum, and you click on it. It'll take you, um, I don't know, a few seconds, and you could sign up for free. There's about 1,200 people worldwide. And we're sharing news and events and, and, and Bible studies and prayers and all sorts of things going on in there, okay? Uh, so this is like a picture of it here. This is a, one of the pages. And so um, I had seen this video because it was sent to me by our, uh, our brother Clive. And I watched a, a portion of the video and I shared it with my wife and she was in tears. And, and I shared it in the forum and it lit up in the forum because there was a bunch of people that were either already watching it, that had it on their to watch list, that just finished watching it. And it was fantastic. Everybody loved it. Uh, many of you guys know her. This is Deep Believer Channel. And the video is people will start teleporting to safety, find out why and how. How? But there was much more that was in this video uh, by this pastor, this teacher. And many of you guys know I was on her channel as well, uh, explaining these differences in the Gospels and so forth. And so in the end of this video, which is what I want to share with you, is what made a change for me that started on Saturday night. I began to change my prayer life just a little bit. All my prayers were still my prayers, but I started to change a little bit about how I was praying. Not all of it, but in parts of it. Instead of this, Lord, will you please, or Lord, this, or Lord, I was giving him thanks, knowing that on the cross, this reminder in this video, that on the cross, he already finished and gave us everything. And boy, did I need that reminder. And so this began the process for me. So I want you guys to listen to this and hopefully it'll reach you guys as well. 
uh, who haven't seen it yet. But let's have a listen to, you know, two, three minutes here. Give me one second. By everything you shared, their faith is definitely strengthened. What advice would you give them? I mean, the whole interview was advice and ministering and witness all this stuff. But what would you say to those watching right now if they want the relationship that you have with the Lord? Because like you said, you're no one special. Okay, first John 4 17, the last part of the verse says, As he is, so are you in this world. The word says, The works that I do, you can do also and greater. Mount of Transfiguration was a work. Miracles, signs, and wonders. Most people gravitate to that so they can look good. It does something for their ego to make them somebody. But Jesus spent 30 years of submission under authority to develop character for three and a half years of ministry. We we neglect the, the supernatural. That's what he walked in, humbling himself for the spectacular moment. And so we're distracted by that. God, everything Jesus did is so that we could be like him. When he said it is finished, this is what it says in some of the Aramaic. I've run the race. I've reached my goal. Bride, come forth. How about that, right? In the Aramaic. I have reached my goal. Bride, come forth. It's finished. It's finished. And I'll close it with this then. On a Rosh Hashanah, 18 years ago in Perth, Australia, Jesus was standing in front of me and he had a centurion's helmet. That's the one with the plume on, so that the soldier, common soldier could look and look where the officer is and follow and, okay. And he's trying to hand it to me. And I, I know the last piece of equipment you put on before you enter the field of conflict is the helmet. And I said, no, 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 Lord, we're not ready. And he thrust it into my chest. He said, take it and go. I've already given you everything you need for life and victory. Then he said this that changed my life. Now go and enforce the victory. See, we're always trying to win a victory. He's already won. All we have to do is enforce what he's done. What does that mean? He's already made the way that we can walk in. It belongs to everybody, not just special few. There's a grace that he gives. I can only speak for my life. He gave me a special grace through years of pursuing so that I could walk in this. The desire was there, but I have a passion to teach God's people and make it simple and show them how this belongs to every believer, not just a select few. John 3.3, 3, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, and Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What was he saying? If you are born again, you can see. And if you can see, you now have access. That's good, because a lot of people see that as if you're not born again, which is true, you can't get to heaven, but it's more than that. It is, you are now able to walk in the holy supernatural realm of God. And that, right, that, that, word, that word see is ego, to gaze at with wide open eyes. That is all. See that? I got to tell you, watch it again if you need to and listen to it. But I would actually recommend just go watch the entire thing. It is it's spectacular. But when you get to that point, as you watch the whole thing, it'll really open up to you. And uh, to me, it really spoke about prayer life as well. That that point where it's it's not an. Oh, Lord, will you please? Oh, Lord, will you please? Yes, of course, there's asking of things from the Lord as well and not just presuming that you're going to the third heaven and things like that, right? But it's this understanding that it is already done. He has already accomplished it. You know, he talks about a back pain that he had in the, in the, it lasted 30 years, but he, he would just deal with it and say, no, it's I'm already victorious in it. And, you know, it doesn't mean that you're faking it. it you know, it's expecting the Lord because the work is done that it'll be granted because it is in faith. It is in him. It is by him, through him, the finished work on the cross. And that started to change in me on Saturday night. And I started to change those prayers. And I started to feel lighter because I was feeling pretty heavy. And so that began this, this feeling lighter. And then on Saturday, and this is where we're going to go into it. This is the 54, the complete 54 book Apocrypha. We've talked on it before. We've shared on it before. Look at this. Essentially a five-star rating with 2,366 reviews because it's awesome. I have it right here. It was recommended by one of our sisters. We've talked about it before. Like I said, uh, our sister Tanya shared it. And I had been meaning to go into other pieces in it. And in fact... Um, in the next video, it will most likely be the video that I was talking about that I was going to do on the Apocryphas. We're going to go into, uh, I believe, five books, maybe more by then, but five books of the Apocrypha and show their connection into what they're telling us in the is to come, in the prophetic for the end of days, that we can clearly show within Scripture is directly connected to the differences in the Gospels and the revelation of the 14 years and above. It's absolutely incredible. And so what happened on Sunday morning, 
Again, on Monday, you guys will be watching maybe Tuesday at the earliest. On Sunday morning, I come into the garage. I grab a seat in my chair, and I, I look at the book, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to pick it up and start looking to see what else is in there. And I went in to see what the different titles were, and there was the one from Polycarp. And we know Polycarp quite well in this ministry in the sense that he is um, he was the Bishop of Smyrna. And as the Bishop of Smyrna, that's a big deal to this ministry, to us in the end of days. And so he had the first one, as I had mentioned earlier, excuse me, which is called um, um, the epistle, Polycarp's epistle, and then the next one, which is his martyrdom. And so I thought, let's have a read. And boy, am I glad I did, because I I got a little bit of the uh, of the fear of God put into me. And you might think it's it's going to be a part when it comes to the martyrdom. And he's talking about what's happening to people, which is quite terrifying in itself. But that wasn't what got me. It was this conversation he has about one guy. And his wife. And I thought, whoa, I thought, whoa. Because remember, even though I wasn't looking to do what I was planning for riches, I knew that it would bring in probably a fair abundance and relatively quickly. So if I didn't have it properly grounded, or who knows, maybe it would have caused me to pull back a little bit more and to do more and to think I was serving the Lord more by bringing in more more uh, um, uh, wealth, if you will more riches to be able to support the ministry. Now, that was my plan, but who knows how things could have gone. If I know that this is my calling, why would I distract myself with something else just because I'm going through a down portion through, I'm not in a debt, not going down, but in a lull. Why would I allow myself to do that? And I just never really quite put it together until I started reading this in Polycarp. So let's go to the Epistle of Polycarp. Now, I want you to understand, in the Epistle of Polycarp, it comes before his martyrdom, of course. And he's writing this epistle to a group of people. Listen to what he says in this, in this, in the Epistle of Polycarp. It's very short. I think it's only, um, I think it's only like four or so pages, four or five pages. It's not very long. But listen to what he says here in this portion. This is in chapter five. For if we please him in this present world, we will receive from him that which is to come, even as he promised us to, rise, to raise us from the dead, comma, and that if we are worthy citizens of his community, we will also reign with him. What do we know about a group of people reigning with the Lord? What do we know about this group of people? We know it pretty well, don't we? There's only one group outside of the Jews who were promised their millennial reign but never got to experience it yet. We know that they're going to be resurrected for their promised millennial reign. However, there's another group too. And we've shared on this group many times. It is the Smyrna group who Polycarp is the bishop of. And listen to what it says. We know this, right? Those who never took the mark, who never worshipped the beast. It's talking about the worker group during the time of seals who are here for the 40 days and then to the 50th anointing and then work during the time of seals. We also know that this is them who have died and that they're the ones who are resurrected. And we know this because it says neither have received the mark upon the foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is the group that Polycarp was addressing. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. So what's the first resurrection? This group here, who's going to be resurrected to rule and reign with them. Blessed in Revelation 20, verse 6, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. We know who this group is because there's only one group mentioned who will not be hurt by the second death. And it's the church of Smyrna precisely who is represented by Polycarp. 
as he's addressing this group in like the pre-portion of which we see here, right? So uh, tribulation, okay, even let's start in Revelation 10, verse 2. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and shall have tribulation 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death. Wait till we cover some of this. And I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, he that overcometh shall not be hurt by the second death. There's only one group that's told they wouldn't be hurt by the second death. The only ones that can't be hurt by the second death are the ones that were resurrected for the millennial reign to rule and reign with them. See, in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power. This is Smyrna. You guys all know it. We've taught on it many times. And when we go to Luke 14, we've shared on this too. We know that there are two weddings in the end of days. There is the pre-trib Gentile bride. And what was he just reading there? He just said that that wording was the wording for bride come. You see, when you read it in the Aramaic, his, he, in, in the power and the authority that he had and in his death and resurrection, he has given it to his bride who is here, who has the power and the ability to, to give him thanks for it and not always be begging. Sometimes we pray for it, but we need to also learn to understand that we already have this power and that we can thank him for it in advance, if you will. But we've already got it. We're just not aware. And so if we start to change some of that prayer life in parts of it, realizing that you have it already, it starts to change your thoughts. You start to rewire some of the way we pray for things in this expectation that, hey, we've already got it. In Christ's spirit filled, we've already got it. He's already died for us for it. And it has already been given. And so we know that there are two weddings. There's the Gentile bride wedding, which is the Luke 14, starting in verse 7. And we know that there's the one in Matthew, um, in Matthew, I think 22, that relates to Matthew chapter 25. And that is the Jewish wedding that comes at the end. One is the type of Ruth. One is a type of Esther at the end. And so we've spoken on this. This is the pre-trib group. This is the pre-trib being taken out. But then only Luke's, as we've said many times, has the great banquet after the wedding. We know that this is a picture of the Lord when he returns from the seven-day Gentile wedding, when he returns on the eighth day. So when the pre-trib happens, the 50 days have started, the seven-day wedding takes place, the Son of Man returns on the eighth day, for which he is going to have a banquet meal somewhere, wherever he's going to gather them, on the earth. Remember what that video just said? That's why I find it so fascinating. Look at what it said. People will be teleported to safety. So he talks about these differences within this in relation to being teleported or translated to different places, whether it be a rapture or a different typology of it. This is what's going to happen to this group, to wherever he brings them to have this meal with them before everything starts. This is going to happen on the eighth day. And who's the group that this is going to happen to? In Luke 14, 14, halfway through, for thus shall be recompensed, for thus thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. This is that same group. This is the this is the purpose of talking about the resurrection of the just here. It is that same group that will take part in the resurrection, like Smyrna and Polycarp is the one that's addressing it and talking about it. So it's absolutely perfectly fitting that it's Polycarp in his epistle talking to this group of people about this for those who are worthy to be a part of his resurrection to reign with him. Now let's go to the second one. Watch this. This is where it was like a punch in the nose. This is where... I said, all right. And this was Sunday morning after I'd finished and I had finished uh, the two the two books with Polycarp. I went into my wife and she knows that uh, she knows what I was doing. She was she's always supportive. So in her beautiful support, um, she knows I had this experience to be able to do this and that if it wouldn't take much time and I could do both. Yet I knew better this division. 
And that's why I was struggling. I went in and told my wife, I'm not doing it anymore. And I explained to her why, and I broke it down and she starts crying saying, Oh, thank you, Lord. You know, thank you. And because, you know, she didn't want the division, this pulling me away from, from my calling enough that I'm not fully focused in it to be able to reach many more with it. And so this, because of this, this was the point that I said, I hear you, Lord. Listen to what it says. And this is Polycarp talking to that same group. So this is still in the epistle about those who will be resurrected, those who you're going to see have more understanding. Listen to what it says. And so when I read this, it's not that I was thinking it was me. It was that I didn't want it to be me. That's the key. All right. Chapter 11. And it says, I am deeply sorry for Valens, who was once made an elder. So an elder, when you go look in these other definitions, it also means a priest, right? So if it's this priestly group line that's working, as we've been talking about so much, this, this Ephesus, I mean, this um, uh, Smyrna group, this Luke 24 group, this group being prepared, who were called 14thers, he says, I am deeply sorry for Valens, who was once made an elder among you, once was made, right? That he so little understands the place which he was given to him. Ouch. Soon as I read that, I knew I was in trouble, and I, in a good trouble. I knew that what I was looking for, I was about to find. Whoever this Valens guy was, was an elder priest among them and had little understanding of the place he was given. Yikes. I advise, therefore, that you keep from greed. You see? What was it that, that pulled Valens away? Greed. And when you go and read in a lot of this of the epistle portion, he talks about uh, uh, riches and, and that the love of money pulling people away. That the love of money he even had at the top of his list. I wasn't worried about any love of money. But then you go on and also read, and he says that, you know, that I'd be given not too much, that it pulls me away into the world, and not too little that I end up stealing to be able to do things and get things, but to give me just enough. You see? And that's that's all I'm desiring is enough that we can maintain and grow and reach more and help the ministry in Uganda and do those things. That's what I was trying to do. But I was torn. And I didn't want to be a Valens who, who decided to go away because he understood little about what was given him. I understand what's been given to me, so there's no way I'm going to be a Valens. And what was it? It was greed. So he warns them, advises them, therefore, to keep from greed and be pure and truthful. Keep yourselves from all evil. For how, many, uh, for how may he who cannot attain self-control in these matters prescribe it on another? If any man does not obtain abstain from greed, he will be defiled by idolatry and will be judged as if he were among the nations who do not know. Yikes. That he would be judged among the nations who do not know the judgment of God. Here was a guy who knew the judgment of God. Here was a guy that had understanding and yet comes out, didn't realize his position because he ends up forsaking it, if you will, for the greed of, of more material gain. I certainly didn't want to be like that. I didn't want to even tempt myself. Or do we not know that the holy ones will judge the world? Remember that in Luke, right? When it's in uh, Luke 20 or 22, and, and you have the, the apostles going back and forth, uh, Lord, who's the greatest, right? And then he talks about how we will judge them in the end. But as Paul teaches, now listen to this, okay? Or do we not know that the holy ones will judge the world, as Paul teaches? But I have neither perceived nor heard any such thing among you. You ain't going to hear it here. You ain't going to hear it here. It isn't going to happen anymore, all right? No way. It never even started. It was just the preparation and idea. It ain't going to happen. So thank you, Lord. Among whom the blessed Paul labored, who are praised in the beginning of his letter 
for concerning you, he boasts in all the assemblies who them who then alone had known the Lord for he for we had not yet known him. OK, so there's this group knowing ahead of time before this other group coming gets this understanding, which relates to this Polycarp group. Therefore, brothers, I am deeply sorry for him, Valens, and for his wife. When I got there, it was it was like a punch in the gut. And may the Lord grant them true conversion. Therefore, be also moderate in in, in this matter yourselves and do not regard such men as enemies, but call them back as fallible and straying members that you may hold uh, that you may make whole the body of you all. For in doing this, you edify yourselves. Wow. That was all I needed. That right there did it for me. But I finished reading the rest of it. And then I went in after pondering and told my wife. And that was it. I scrapped the website. The guy was calling me this morning to get the website going. And um, I, I put a cancel to it. I, I canceled it. It was only $200. I got my refund for it. And uh, the other stuff, I deleted all the stuff that I had set up. All of it. I'm not risking it, guys. And I knew I wasn't going to risk it, but I didn't want to tempt risking it either. Now, listen to what he says about this group that he's, ta that he's talking to in this epistle. Remember, he's having this conversation to this group that, that foreknew these things, that was given understanding. Listen to what he says in chapter 12, verse 1. For I am confident that you are all well-versed in the writings, and from you nothing is hidden. For I am confident that you are very, uh, I'm confident that you are well versed in the writings and from you nothing is hidden. But to me, this is not granted. He's addressing a group pre in all of this. Who he's now saying, but none of these things are spoken about this in your group, in, in this group of people. I'm not saying it's only us, but a portion being us as those in Christ watching now, prepared and ready. But the second portion in chapter 12, in verse one, I believe it does have some connection potentially to us. Because what does he say? For I am confident that you are well versed in the writings and from you, nothing is hidden. There's a group who's been given revelation, who's been given understanding. And what does Polycarp say? But to me, this is not granted. Don't we know that there's a group that, that is part of the, the Luke group, which is part of who Polycarp is a representation of in Smyrna? But does that mean that, that Polycarp was part of the group that received revelation? No, not according to Polycarp. Polycarp said he wasn't privy to receive this understanding before it all started. But that he's addressing a group who had the understanding. And we've been talking about how this is the revelation being given. Is it completed? Is it full? Is it all done and we know everything? Absolutely not. But we know it's a preparation. We've known this for a while. And what do we know about the Luke 21 guys, uh, the Luke 24 or Luke 21? What do we know about the Luke 21 guys? This group connected to Smyrna, that Polycarp will become the ones uh, uh, as the bishop type over them. What do we know about them? Well, when the Lord comes and begins his 40 days and he has the meal with them, right? He has that meal with them, sits and serves them. What do we know he tells them? Only to this group, that all things in Luke 24, 44, and 45, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. What did Polycarp just say? For I am confident that you are very well versed in the writings and from you, nothing is hidden. But to me, this is not granted. His work is different. His portion and what he's going to be doing is different. But there's a group within them that he's addressing who are connected to the pre that will take part 
in the resurrection of the just to reign with them who has the understanding. And Polycarp is connected to this group we've been talking about the whole time, which is Smyrna. Wild stuff, guys. Wild stuff in the ancient writings, man. It's so awesome. Well, now check this out. Do we, do we know some things about how it all begins? What, what are some of the things that we've taught on here in Scripture? Well, let me show you one of them. Let's go to Genesis 16 and the story about Abraham. What do we know about Abraham? Well, we know that Abraham has Ishmael. And Ishmael is a type, it, it's, he's the Arab line. We know, right, through the Muslims. We know that he's, um, he, he's a typology of the raven. We know he's a prophetic picture in the typology of, of Syria, when Syria comes and destroys Jerusalem. Okay? When do we know that this takes place? Well, we know that it takes place at the end of the 50 days. Okay? So there was the seven, there was the pre-trib, there was the seven-day wedding. He's addressing this group who has understanding that he was not privy to receiving, that, that have the understanding of, of things, uh, of Scripture. And he's addressing them that they're all taking part with them in the resurrection of the just, right? In the resurrection for ruling and reigning with them as priests. And we know that when this 40 days portion, which is the Smyrna representation that Polycarp is a part of, because remember, we're now reading Polycarp. Polycarp's portion, let's go to this. Let me, let's go to the Ministry Revealed book. Remember in the seven churches, okay? In the, in the story that we reveal about the seven churches, you had Ephesus that relates to the apostles. We know that's the, the seven days from the wedding, but they also, they're not going to be gone after the seven-day wedding. They're still going to remain during seals. And we know that Smyrna, in relation to Polycarp and who he represents, he's the representation of the 40 days of the Son of Man when he comes, and they will remain to the 50th and receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And they will also remain during seals. But in the is of what happened in church history, it's a picture of this period of time represented by Smyrna, which is really just talking about this pre-stuff before the 14 years begins. Right at the point of the 50 days and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and then bang, the tribulation begins. Well, what do we know about that period of time coming to an end? which is this Smyrna portion connected to the, from the eighth day to the 47 days, which is 40 days complete, then three days and the anointing of the Holy Ghost is like a picture of that Smyrna portion. And then the 14 years begin. What do we know about it? Well, as we just said, we know these things about Ishmael. We know that it takes place at the true feast of trumpets. And we know something from, from uh, um, Abraham as well. What do we know about Ishmael with the wild man and Abraham, which is a picture here, as we've shared in the past, it's a picture of the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation, which is 13 years, and then the promise comes at the 14th year. Well, we know that Abraham was what? Abraham was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. This is a prophetic picture, as we've taught many times, of the beginning of the 14 years. Then we see 13 years later, Abraham's 99. God makes a covenant between his family. It's like the end of the seven years of seals, the six years of trumpets, and now the Lord is going to come. Here's the 99 or 13 years later, when Abraham's 99, God makes a covenant with him and his family, and you see that Ishmael is now 13. We go to chapter 21, and we see the birth of Isaac, and Abraham is now 100 years old, the 14 years later. That's the promise of the Lord returning four feet down on the Mount of Olives. So we've understood this, but what did we just see there? We had a prophetic picture in the count that Abraham was 86 years old. Well, lo and behold, now we're in the book of the martyrdom of Polycarp. And remember that Polycarp is the prophetic picture of that from the eighth day to the end of 50 days. 
because in the in the was that's the period of time in history in the is from the church age that represents that 40 or so 43 days and then which is connected to the is to come smyrna it doesn't mean they're gone after this time it just means this is the key portion in the above 14 years that represents them okay we we've understood this we've talked on these things before and look at what we have for polycarp okay watch this polycarp is watch this polycarp said and remember now we're in in uh, um his martyrdom portion polycarp said for 86 years i have been his servant and he has done me no wrong and now and how can i blaspheme my king who saved me polycarp now is mentioning at the time of his captivity, when he's about to be killed, he's talking about being 86 years old. How old was Abraham at the beginning of the 14 years in the prophetic picture? 86 years old. What do we know takes place during that 40 to 43 days <clears throat> after the wedding? That will take it from the eighth day after the wedding to the end of the 50 days and that anointing. What do we know happens? Well, we know that right after that anointing on the 50th day, which is when the dove anoints them and then the dove is gone, right? It's going to be Acts 2.0, we call it. What do we know happens? Syria, Ishmael comes and attacks and they're coming at the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, so they're coming on the day and hour no one knows, right? the day and the hour. We've talked about that many times. And we know that during this 40 days, represented by Smyrna in the is, even though they're going to remain during seals, what do we know about them? Well, let's go to Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, when, when we've talked about this in the past, we know that when this all begins, when it all starts, it's going to be instantaneous because remember tens of millions of people are going to vanish so if tens of millions of people are going to vanish and israel is attacked in the north by iran in 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 tel aviv and haifa are destroyed and there's a seven day wedding and then the lord's returning on the eighth day it's going to get crazy fast so what do we know about this time well it's luke 21:12 because Luke 21, 10, he's saying, then he said unto them, this is the beginning of the 14 years right here. This is that beginning of at Abraham being 86 years old. This is the red horse rider, nation against nation. But Luke says, but first, right? Or but before all these. What does he say is going to happen to them? They shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and to prisons brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And, it sh and you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. This is in the midst of the 40 days. This is in the midst of after the wedding, during the 40 days. Um, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience, possess you your souls. Now, these are things that are going to happen in the 40 days to this remnant worker bride that are working during seals. The Smyrna group that Polycarp is a prophetic picture of in the is that we're talking about in relation now into the is to come. And we know that they remain during seals. So this isn't only during the 40 days. It's going to carry on during seals as well. But this picture right here begins in the 40 days. Now, let's go see what Polycarp says about this group. 
because this is all in that time of the persecution of Polycarp, which represents this 40 to, to the 50th day portion. Listen to what it says. Blessed then and noble are all the are all the martyrdoms which took place according to the will of God, for we must be very careful to assign the power over uh, all to God. For who would not admire their nobility and patience and love of their master? For some were torn by scourging until the mechanism of their flesh was seen even to the lower veins and arteries, and they endured so that even the bystanders pitied them and mourned. So they were cheering for them to be killed, but when they saw this happening to them, they started having pity and mourning them. And some even reached such a pitch of nobility that none of them groaned or wailed, showing to all of us that at that hour of their torture, the noble, the nor noble martyrs of Christ were absent from the flesh, or rather that the Lord was standing by talking with them. You see that? Is this, you know, you would think that this is the thing that terrified me. No, this wasn't what terrified me. What terrified me was being cut off and, and not taking part. I would much rather have part in this. As crazy as that might sound. But to you guys makes sense. But this, let's face it, this seems pretty terrifying. This is what was happening to them in first century Smyrna. They were the 14thers. And in the end, it's 14 years. 14ers. Yikes, right? But look at this. Noble, enduring, possess their patience, right? In your patience, possess you your souls. And then what does he say? That they didn't scream, they didn't groan, they didn't wail. Why? Because it would, didn't hurt them. It was like nothing was taking effect, right? Why? Listen to what he said in, in Luke 21, 18. But there shall not a hair of your head perish. Well, make it quick, Lord. <laughs> I'm getting down to the edges. <laughs> you see, but not a hair on your head per will, shall, shall perish. They didn't feel anything. It wasn't like a brave heart where he was being torn apart and, and, and cut open and he was screaming at every part. The Lord will protect his remnant. This is his group that he's resurrecting to rule and reign with them. And we know that this isn't only during the 40 to 43 day portion, but that it will carry on into seals because we know this is the group who will be resurrected, not having taken the mark or the number or worship the beast, who will take part in the first resurrection so that the second death has no power over them. And that is only the Smyrna group. Pretty wild, eh? Amazing, amazing stuff. So terrifying, but amazing at the same time. This is that Smyrna group. And listen to what it says over here. I thought this was also interesting to share. Uh, in chapter four, for this reason, therefore, brothers, we do not commend those who give themselves up since the good news does not give this teaching. Now, many of you guys have maybe thought of it jokingly or even considered this. I know myself and my wife, we used to half jokingly say this was that, you know, could you imagine uh, uh, you you weren't you didn't take part in the pre-trib? You thought you were in Christ. You were ready. You were watching. The Lord never informed you. And this is why we say in Luke chapter 12, we know that the Lord will make known to this remnant group before the pre-trib that they're remaining until he returns from the wedding to have a meal with them so that they're not in a panic and freaking out for the next seven days, wondering why, Lord, why weren't they taken when they were watching, when they were praying, when they were diligent, when they were loving them? You see? So he's going to warn them. But what would happen is, could you imagine if, if that didn't happen to some and you thought you were in Christ? My wife and I used to joke and say, could you imagine we know it's happened? Tens of millions of people have vanished. I don't want to be here. This was before knowing what I know and, and what's been taking place. But what would you want to do? 
I would, I, there's nukes coming, there's nukes coming. Honey, kids, get in the car. We're driving to, where's it landing? Where's it landing? Oh, it's going to land uh, in Edmonton, three hours north of Calgary. Get in the car, man. We're gunning it to Edmonton. I don't want to be here during tribulation. Are you kidding me? Absolutely not. So many of us have probably, have probably wondered at some point, you know, if I'm here during the tribulation, maybe it'd just be easier to go give myself up. Nope. Not according to what he's telling us here. The scriptures do not talk about just turning tuck tail and go give yourself up so you can be beheaded and then off you go. No, it's remaining to teach. It's remaining to, to bring more to the Lord during the time of tribulation and not to just turn and cower. It's one thing to have been taken captive. It's one thing to just run down to them and surrender and say, here I am. Okay. That won't be your purpose during the end of days if you're here and you will know it because I believe we are a group being prepared in the revelation of the understanding of the is to come and it's for a purpose and for a reason. Look at this. Polycarp was 86 years old. For some of you out there, brothers and sisters, 70s, maybe even in your 80s, thinking, oh Lord, I can't do it. Yes, you can. He will give you the ability to do it. Okay. I'm not saying everybody will be, but I'm saying that is that is a, to a great extent what's happening here in the ministry. All right. Now, let's keep going in this. Let's see what he has next. So we know that he's he's 86 years old, directly connected to the beginning, like uh, Abraham, right at the time of the beginning of the 14 years, which is connected to Ishmael, which is the beginning of the 14 years when the attack will come on Jerusalem, which is connected to what? The Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows. We've been sharing that so much lately, right? We know what it means now at the end of six years of, of the first six years of seals and why Mark says in his discourse, the day and hour no one knows. We know that at the end of six years of trumpets, when the Lord returns feet down and he's there as lightning, it says the day and hour no one knows. It's the Feast of Trumpets. But it doesn't say that in Luke, does it? This was shared in the forum, uh, I think, yesterday. And this, this was just another great reminder. You see, we've shared this. This is that first group of workers. Then he talks about if, if he comes in the second watch or in the third watch. And then he says, here he's talking, and he says, uh, and this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to have been broken through. Okay? Now listen to what he says and what Peter responds with. In verse 40 of Luke 12. But ye therefore, uh, be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man comes at an hour when you think not. And this is where Peter jumps in and says, Then Peter said unto them, Lord, speak thou this parable unto us or even unto all. You see, he's speaking to the watchmen. There are three watch groups that he's speaking to. That Smyrna pre-group, that Philadelphia uh, uh, 144,000 group, and then the group when he returns feet down who will work during the millennial reign related to the 12 tribes. Who is he talking to here? He's talking to the first group. At an hour when you think not. At a day and an hour? No, at an hour. Why not day and hour? Because it won't be the Feast of Trumpets. It'll be a day that we can know just not maybe the hour of that day. What is the day? Feast of weeks, the true feast of weeks. And I believe it'll be in 2024 based on what we've shared through scripture to be able to understand it. So not knowing the hour, but being able to understand that day. So now look at what he says next. We got the 86 years, those connections there. Now listen to what he says. Again, this is in his martyrdom portion. So this is all in that portion of the above, right near the end in that 50 days. I bless you that you have granted me this day and hour that I may share among the number of the martyrs. So he's about to now be a martyr at the time of this day and hour. Now you're thinking, why would you share that, Alan? You just said 
it, it wasn't it was we know the day but not the hour and here polycarp is talking about the day and hour why would polycarp be talking about the day and hour let me show you let's go to the calendar and i'm going to bring it to 2024 so you guys can all see and understand where i'm coming from and what i'm sharing we know that the true seventh sabbath count to the true feast of weeks is the eighth of av because the beginning of the count is from wheat harvest winter wheat when it begins to harvest not from barley and here it is it brings us to the 12th of august 2024 which is the eighth of av okay this is the pre-trib escape and the 50 days begin okay you go to the eighth day the lord's returning here and he's here for 40 days which i think brings it to um right here okay to the 29th of september we can know the day but not the hour okay that day but not the hour i believe is this right here depending which side of the world you're on in this range right here okay and so that's that's knowing the day but not knowing the hour now polycarp is telling us that he's now at a point that he gets to take part in the martyrdom that is represented within this period of time that started from the 40 days when the Lord returned from the wedding to which the Lord leaves. And we know that there are three days remaining. And so at this three days remaining, which brings us to the time of the end of Smyrna in the is in the church age. And it brings us to the, that portion of the end of Luke's portion of his discourse. We know that there's this anointing of the Holy ghost that will come. And the 14 years begins. When is the 14 years portrayed as beginning? Right here, right? At true feast of trumpets. Okay? At true feast of trumpets. Because six years later, when the Lord is seen coming on heavenly Mount Zion, it'll be at the time of the day and hour no one knows. Feast of trumpets after six years from here. Okay? So to 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. 30. So Feast of Trumpets, 2030, the day and hour no one knows. That's the end of the six years of seals to the Lord coming to fulfill the final seventh year. So Polycarp is saying here that he's 86 years old and Abraham was 86 years old. And Abraham with Ishmael represents this period of time when Ishmael comes at the Feast of Trumpets and destroys Jerusalem and starts the 14 years as the prophetic picture of Abraham with his sons when he was 86 years old. Now, we're reading that at the at his death of Polycarp, ending this, this is age of Smyrna, which is the prophetic picture of Luke 21, which happens to the end of the 50 days, he's now telling us that it his death is coming at a time when he will be able to take part with the other martyrs who also were dying and being put to death during this 40-day period. He's telling us that it's a day and hour. What is the reference of day and hour? We all know what it is. No one knows the day and hour is that Hebrew idiom, right? Of that day and of that hour is Rosh Hashanah, is the Feast of Trumpets. So we know it's the Feast of Trumpets. We've been sharing it for a long time. And here we are seeing Polycarp, 86, and saying that he now gets to take part with the other martyrs at this day and hour. And you say, well, maybe you're stretching it. Maybe the reason for that day and hour is he was just giving the wording. Well, even though these are apocryphas and they're not scripture, Many of these are directly connected to Scripture. In fact, I believe all of them are. Right? We go to Enoch. A lot of these, a lot of these books were in the Bible and are in the Bible of other parts. But I want you to understand something, and I've said this many times about this. When it comes to the apocryphas, we never go to the apocryphas and then go to try to find it in Scripture. We've never done that. 
we have understood and revealed in scripture and then go into the apocryphas and as we read find all of these things directly relating and connected to these things that we've revealed in the scriptures and that's what's happening here 86 day and hour both of those are related to the beginning of the 14 years and you might still think well you know that might be stretching it a bit all right let's take it a step further let's see what else he says okay uh, bless that day and hour. Um, he's giving glory to the Lord for it. Now listen to this. Watch this. Chapter 16. Um, at length, the lawless men, seeing that his body could not be consumed. So if you guys know the story of Polycarp, Polycarp was to be burned with fire. They took all his clothes off. He was able to keep his sandals because he was a, he was respected in all of the years and what he did. And so they allowed him to keep his shoes on and he was put in the fire. And instead of, of, um, of piercing his hands and being a typology like Christ, they just bound his hands because he says, look, I'm not going to flee. Don't worry about it. I'm protected. So what happens is they, they bind him to, to the tree and they set everything on fire and he doesn't burn. Okay, if you know the story of Polycarp, he doesn't burn and the flame is like a wall around him. And everybody's like, what's going on? So then listen to what happens. At length, the lawless man, seeing that his body could not be consumed by the fire, commanded an executioner to go up and pierce him with a dagger, kind of like Christ, right? And when he did this, there came out a dove. And when he did this, there came out a dove and very much blood so that the fire was quenched and all the crowd marveled that there was such a difference between the unbelievers and the chosen ones and of the chosen ones which he in which he was indeed one the wonderful martyr polycarp who in our days was an apostolic and prophetic teacher overseer of the universal assembly of Smyrna for every word which he uttered from his mouth was both fulfilled and will be fulfilled. What came out? A dove. Now, why does this matter to us, brothers and sisters? Because we know that right here on the 50th day from the pre-trib escape and the 50 days beginning this is the 50th day at true Pentecost. True Pentecost is, of course, when the dove is released, right? We go to Acts chapter 2. And we know from Acts chapter 2, this is when Pentecost was fully come. And when Pentecost was fully come, they were accused of being drunk on new wine. The only way you can get drunk on new wine is if it was the time of the grape harvest. And the grape harvest goes anywhere from about mid-September to the early part of October in any given year. This is the time of the grapes and new wine. And what is Polycarp? What happens at Polycarp? Which is directly related to this portion of the end of his Smyrna in the is. 86. Day and hour, dove. Are you seeing the picture? All three of those things are related right to here. Listen to what the last one says. He says, um, this is in chapter 20. Who takes his chosen ones from his own servants and to him who is able to bring us all in his grace and bounty to his heavenly kingdom by his only begotten child, Jesus Christ, be glory, honor, might, and majesty for all time. Now listen to this. Greet all the holy ones, those who are with us, and Everetus, who wrote the letter with his whole house, greet you. Doesn't that sound familiar to us as well? Well, it should, because we've taught it from Romans 16. We've shown how Priscilla and Aquila are also a prophetic picture of the remnant workers of 
the of the uh, um, Smyrna group who are going to put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles, which means they're working during seals and they're putting their necks on the line, which is just like those martyrs. And what does it say in verse 16? Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. You see, everything he has mentioned is directly associated, of course, to the, the Smyrna and the Priscilla's and the Aquila's and everything he mentions about his life at the time of his death is all 100% related to the true Pentecost and the Feast of Trumpets that follows immediately after it. Every single one. Remember this in Second Chronicles? Because remember that that um, that if, uh, uh, Ishmael is a picture of Syria, right? And what do we know? It's at the end of the year. This is when Syria comes, right? When the lion comes and he's going to compass Jerusalem about and he's going to destroy them. And this is the part that the Jews and the church don't realize is coming. The Jews have no idea that they need to be removed from the land for the next seven years. Only a remnant will be brought back to lay the foundation, but the rest will be removed because the land must rest for seven years before the Lord can actually build the temple, which will begin in trumpets. We'll cover that again in a little bit when we get to the, the timeline. What else do we know? Well, we know the, the actual prophetic picture of the actual Ishmael was the one connected to Gedaliah. Gedaliah is, is, a, is a, a, a fast and mourning that takes place on the 3rd of Tishri. And it's called the Fast of Gedaliah. But it's actually supposed to take place on the 1st of Tishri. But because it's a feast of the Lord, they don't want to observe it because it's on a day and hour they don't know, the first or the second day. So they observe it here. But when did the event take place? It happened at the Feast of Trumpets. And who was the one responsible? It was Ishmael. Ishmael, when Gedali was put in charge after the ninth of Av attack, which is what we talk about, when the pre-trib escape happens and the seven-day wedding is taking place to the Lord returning on the eighth day, this is when Oran will attack and destroy um, uh, Haifa and Tel Aviv. And then the Lord will return on the eighth day, and this war will probably be short-lived in the Middle East. Oh, it's still going on now. It's a preparation. I believe that what we're reading, uh, what we see going on right now is directly related to this, just so you guys know where I'm at. I believe it's this right here. In Luke chapter 21, verse 9, But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. What is this end? He's saying, but the end of days, it's not yet. This is where I believe we are at right now. Okay? We're not at the time yet because I believe, well, I don't even believe. I know that it's going to be at the true feast of weeks. Am I? Do I know with a, a absolute certainty it's going to be 2024? No. Do I believe with a, with, a, with a strength of certainty that it's going to be 2024? Yes. And we've done videos on, as to why. And it would be the, ninth, the 8th of Av. There's your 9th of Av attack. This is the 9th of Av that ends up putting Gedalia in charge, who only ruled for about six weeks. And then Ishmael comes, and Ishmael is coming with his men. And listen to what happened. Because a group of them got to come back after there was this scattering with this war that's going to take place, and a group of them is able to come back. And we see here in Jeremiah 40, verse 11, uh, halfway through, heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah. Had left a remnant of Judah. And that he had set over them Gedalia. Okay? And the fast of Gedalia is because of this right here. Now listen to what it says in verse 12. Even all the Jews returned of the places whither they were driven and came to the land of Judah, to Gedalia, unto Mizpah, and listen to this, gathered wine and summer fruits very much. Gathered wine and summer fruits very much. Why? 
because it was Pentecost. It was the time when it was all ready. And so what happens? There now goes out a word that Ishmael is going to come and he's going to slay Gedalia. Gedalia doesn't quite believe it or doesn't believe it. And what happens? Now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael with his 10 men, hello, with his 10 men came and slew Gedalia and killed him. When did Ishmael come, who is a prophetic picture of the Abraham Ishmael, who is a prophetic picture of the Syria, who's coming? When did it happen? At the Feast of Trumpets. What is this Feast of Trumpets? The day and hour no one knows, which is connected to the time of true Pentecost and is the time when Abraham was 86 years old. Day and hour, 86, and a dove comes out of him. All giving us a prophetic insight to the year's end with the dove and the day and hour no one knows when the 14 years of tribulation will begin. It didn't say, but of that day, that he gets to, in this day, take part. You see, why didn't it just have that kind of wording? That he can take part in this day. But that's not what we got. You see? If it was just this day, I would have been curious then if it was maybe somewhere over here at the beginning of the 50. But he says that this day and hour, he now gets to take part. I just thought it was awesome. The connections there just give us such clarity within it. It's, it's, really, it's really so interesting that we can see these connections and have been able to associate them in Scripture to things that we have already understood. And guess how many times we've done that in the Apocryphas? Now six different books of the Apocrypha. They are all prophetic. You see, remember we see it even with the raven and the dove? Here's the 40 days of the Son of Man coming to the end. Like, what was that, the, the, the 29th or whatever it was, or 26th of, of September in 2024? There's the raven sent out. The raven means Arab, okay? The raven from the dusky hue, from the coloring of their skin. And it means Arab. This is the Ishmael. This is the, the Syria. And we know it's three days later when the dove comes before the raven then uh, brings about the destruction. Why does the raven go first? Because the raven has to compass them about. And so is it going to be a full-on compassing the boat? Or is it a prophetic picture also like, um, like Ishmael did and came to this meal, came to this trumpets, this feast of trumpets to pretend to celebrate it with them when now the wine had been brought in and the summer fruits at the time of Pentecost so that at the feast of trumpets when he's there, bang, the destruction happens. You see? So it's the same type of compassing about and so forth right after the dove who is then released, which is what came out of him when he was killed, and the day and hour, which is the attack of the raven. All right? So hopefully that gave a little bit more insight again into this prophetic timing, which is directly, directly associated to everything we've been teaching in relation to Smyrna and this prophetic picture is, is, is so incredible to be able to see it. Because like I said, what we were just reading was directly related in the is of the church age that in the is to come is a prophetic picture of the 40 to the 50, the beginning of the 40 to the end of the 50 days. And it just so happens that the story of him ends at the end of the 50 days, it's, it's, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. But that's when he died. But we know that the rest still carried on a bit, right? And that's what's going to happen in the years to come. They will still remain during the time of seals. And we were able to prove that by showing to you that those who will take part in the resurrection will be the ones as the, as the worker portion that never took part of the mark uh, never worship the beast and so forth. You see, the evidence that 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 builds and proves out the forty to the fiftieth, and then them also being during the time of seals.
So awesome. I love this stuff, man. <laughs> you see, and I've said it before, this is the stuff that excites me. And anytime I get a little bit blonde down, when I do a teaching, I am energized, I am recharged, and I can't wait to do another teaching. It's those times in between that have caused me to be a little bit too much in my own head. So with that, now what I'm going to do <clears throat> is I'm going to tail this in to the prophetic timeline. And this is where I'm going to cut it for anybody that wants just this prophetic timeline to be able to uh, take it and to share it with others as well. So let's get started here in the timeline. Let me show you what I'm talking about for those that are new. Here's the ministry revealed timeline. And let me get that out of my way. And here it is. You'll see down here, there's notes. So this timeline is uh, in the description box below for anybody that wants it. You can print it off. Um, and it's also on the Ministry Revealed website. It's, I think it's under like all of the videos. So any video you want to go under in the last few years, a couple of years or whatever, uh, it's there. And so you'll see the, the little notes that are down here as well. And I put it all on one page. I wanted it to be straightforward enough that everybody from one piece of paper, not even front back, from one piece of paper on the front can get the entire picture of the 14 years and the small portion called above, okay? And that you can follow it along by reading what's underneath as well. So let's go into this. So this is the ministry revealed, the 14-year tribulation timeline. So the 14 years actually begins here. This is the above portion right here. As we said, when it begins, where do I think it's going to begin? Let's now tie this to the calendar. <clears throat> I believe the pre-trib escape will happen on the 8th of Av, August 12th of 2024. At an hour, we don't know. And again, depending where you are in the world, but it will be based on whatever time the Lord uh, has in his plan based on Jerusalem time. Everything will come from Jerusalem time. August 12th. 8th of Av, okay? So what are we looking at happening at that time? It's the pre-trib escape. The escape of the pre-trib bride, August of 2024. It's the Luke group, bride of Christ, taken up into heaven. They're the spirit-filled group in Christ, spirit-filled. That is the first group that goes. That is the Luke pre-trib. That is the Luke 21, 36 group that says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the pre-trib group. And that's why when you see it in Luke, it says to escape all these things that shall come to pass. You see, one thing that it doesn't include is what we were reading a little earlier in Luke 21, verse 9. Because in Luke 21, verse 9, it's telling you that the end here, the end of days isn't yet. Okay. That this is what's going to come first in Luke 21, 9. So all this war and all this stuff going on in Israel right now, I believe, as I said, is pertaining to Luke 21, 9. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified for these things must come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Okay. It's not the end of days yet. It hasn't begun. Okay. In, in the, understanding that people think of when you talk about end of days it hasn't yet begun this is what we're being told so when we look at this here and we're seeing them being taken that is the pre-trib group of luke from luke 21 36 not only is it luke 21 36 which is what i was just reading out right here it's also the luke group from Luke chapter 14, which relates to the Gentile wedding, which is the wedding feast that's mentioned in Luke. And for those who don't know the differences within the Gospels, that they're actually prophetic, go to our playlist on Ministry Revealed YouTube channel or go to ministryrevealed.com and go to the intro page and watch the first four videos. Because there are two weddings, one in Luke, none in Mark, and one in Matthew. It's the Gentile bride in Luke 14. This is being taken to the third heaven to sit in the lowest room when you get there. This is that group. 
And then there's only the banquet group mentioned in Luke after the wedding because it's to the remnant worker bride who will remain here and will work during seals. We'll cover them in a moment. This is that wedding. So let's go have a look at this again. There they are taken to the wedding. They are those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, like Romans 8 people, like Romans 8, 1. When you read about it, this is them, the pre-trib group, which I personally believe will be about 144 million people, will be about 1.8% of the population of the world. That's your pre-trib group. When the wedding is over, it is going to be a seven-day Gentile wedding, like the picture of Leah at what I believe will be the true Feast of Weeks, not counted from barley, but that begins to be counted from the harvest of winter wheat beginning. From that harvest is the seventh Sabbath, true Sabbaths, that brings us to the eighth of Av as the seventh Sabbath and the pre-trib escape of the bride. Then there's a period of 50 days that begins from the ninth of Av. From the ninth of Av, there's a seven-day wedding taking place in heaven, and the Son of Man will return on the eighth day to be the prophet as he said he would be in Luke chapter 11 when he said he would be as Jonah was to warn them that they're about to be compassed about and destroyed. Now, where does that come from? That comes from Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, it comes from many, many places. But it also comes from Luke chapter 21 when you see it's not about abomination of desolation in Luke. He says, but when you shall see, when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let not them that are in other countries enter there into. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Okay. Now is coming the captivity. They're going to flee into all nations and they're going to be trodden down and Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is over. This is the son of man warning as Jonah did, as he said he would, which is prophetic. And that is the son of man as the white horse rider. See, it's the son of man. Oh, it didn't come any closer. It's the Son of Man coming in a cloud as the white horse rider for 40 days, and that will begin in August of 2024, around the 20th of August or the 16th of Av. That will begin his 40 days, <clears throat> just as we read him warning about here, and just as we see here in this picture, this is him as the white horse rider. When his 40 days as the Son of Man are completed, it brings us to the 29th of September or the 26th of Elul. Just like the story of the ark, it was the 40 days, and when the 40 days came to an end, remember Jesus, even in Ezekiel 21, the, the picture of Ezekiel being called the Son of Man, he's warning that the sword is about to be furbished and given. He's warning that the red horse rider, the sword is about to be given. This is what we see. Even if we go to Revelation chapter six, it's the Lord who is the white horse rider. But then you see the red horse rider. Okay. Then the second seal that was opened. Of course, the son of man could still be the one. Of course, the Lord, the lamb is still going to be there to open the second seal because he's back there before the second seal is opened. And you see that it says there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. All you have to do is read Ezekiel 21 and see that Ezekiel is that prophetic typology of the son of man warning that the sword is about to be furbished. Okay, that's exactly what you're seeing. And so here we are looking at this, and that gives us the timing of the Son of Man ending right here on the 29th of September. And that leaves what? One, two, three days to the year's end. 
which makes the 29th of Elul, the end of the year, it also makes it true Pentecost. This is why right here is when the wheat harvest, when the winter wheat harvest is now gathered in and ready and two loaves of bread are made from it. This is your pre-trib bride. This is now true Pentecost 50 days later at the year's end when wine is actually harvested and new wine is ready and made. It always happens between uh, mid-September to early October every single year. And it just so happens there's 50 days after Pentecost that goes exactly from when the winter wheat was harvested and the two loaves were made to 50 days later when the actual wine is ready and new wine is made. You see, this brings us to the year's end. This brings us to the end of the 50 days for which the Son of Man was here for 50 uh, for 40 days, okay? Let's follow that again. Pre-trip escape happens, the seven-day wedding. The Lord returns on the eighth day. He's here for 40 days. Warning as Jonah warned, so he's coming as the prophet, as the son of man, as the prophet to warn of destruction and Jerusalem being compassed and destroyed. He leaves, and then there's three days to when this remnant group of workers who were with him, who were part of the bride, but were chosen by the Lord to remain and to be his servants, as you saw in Luke 14, that when he returns from the wedding, he has a banquet with this specific group. They're here with them. They remain, and they were waiting for him to return from the wedding. He has a banquet with them wherever he translates them to, and they follow him for 40 days and are with them. When those 40 days are over and the Lord leaves, this is when Syria will come. This is when Syria comes and will start to compass about Jerusalem, like Jesus was warning about. This is the raven. This is the Ishmael. This is Syria. This compassing about, I don't know if it's directly armies compassing about or if there was some agreement made after Iran and Israel went at it and Tel Aviv and Haifa were destroyed. And then when Syria comes, he's playing possum, if you will, where he's going to come and he's going to join them in a meal at Feast of Trumpets. I, we don't know, but it is going to be Syria coming is going to compass about in some form and then destroy Jerusalem at the feast at the true feast of trumpets when he comes at the year's end and destroys at the true feast of trumpets, just like in Second Chronicles 24. But it happens only after the anointing of what we call Acts 2.0 on the 50th day by the Holy Ghost, meaning after this. This is when they will leave from Jerusalem and go and preach to all the nations, and it will begin or continue what started after the escape, the greatest revival in all of human history. And what's happening here is now what? The dove has come, has given them the anointing, and what do we read in the Red Horse Rider? We see that now peace. He's given power to take peace from the earth. And so what do we see? We now see peace is leaving. Okay. They receive the anointing on the 50th day. At true Pentecost, peace leaves. They now go out from Jerusalem and Syria, the Smyrna type, the Ishmael, the raven, now brings the attack and the destruction on Jerusalem. And they are now fleeing they are gone. They are gone into the countries, fleeing to the mountains like Luke 24 said. And you see, Jesus was warning them up until this point. So now this compassing about is about to take place. And he warns them that when you see Jerusalem about to be comp or being compassed about, flee to the mountains, which means at this point, they should all be fleeing. But if you understand this ahead of time and the pre-trib has already happened, anybody listening to this ahead of time and is here and you're in Jerusalem, you should flee right away and not wait for this warning from the Son of Man who's coming to tell you to flee. Because that should take place then from about this point, if it's next year that it starts. And this is the period of the three days of the compassing about. 
the anointing of the Holy Ghost that comes on the remnant workers that were with them. And when they receive that anointing, the Holy Ghost is gone. They go out into all nations from Jerusalem and the attack by Syria begins at the Feast of Trumpets 2024. And it begins the 14 years from the Red Horse Rider, which will bring you now Luke's discourse is over and it brings you now to Mark's discourse. And this is why you see in Luke chapter 13, you don't see any distinction like you did in Luke 21. In Luke chapter 21, you're going to see this here in a moment. I've got so many highlights in Luke 21 that it always takes longer to load. But you see here in Luke 21, then said he unto them, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Why? Because this isn't affecting the above 14 years of Luke's group. Okay? That's why only Luke in 21.12 says, but before all these. So before this stuff, which is nation against nation, which begins the red horse rider, there's other stuff that's going to take place in persecution against these guys. Why? Because they're the ones with the Son of Man there during the 40 days. When that all of that above 50 days is now done and Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed, that's when the, the great sword was given. And we come to Luke 13, and you now see the nation against nation has now begun. Okay? In Mark 13, verse 8, for nation, and, again, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. All of this right here, one, this one verse is the first about two and a half years of tribulation. That's only the first two and a half years of tribulation. Let me show it to you here on the chart. It's right here. The first two and a half years from when the red horse is released and nation against nation begins, the great sword is given. It'll be World War III, nation against nation. Now, when I say World War III, I was talking about this with Mike today. It doesn't mean that all the world just explodes into war and all of a sudden nukes are dropping. No, 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 no. It's going to begin at Jerusalem, just like we saw in Luke 21. Let me show it to you. You can see it also in Jeremiah chapter 4 because the lion that you read in Jeremiah 4 is Syria. Okay? And it's talking about declare ye in Jeremiah 4, 5. Disaster coming from the north. Declare, declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem. Blow ye the trumpet in the land. Okay? What's about to happen? Verse 7. The lion has come up from his thicket. Who's the lion? Well, anybody who knows the history of Assad and coming from the north, anybody who knows the history of Assad knows that his family last name, when they first got into politics, it used to be the, the beast. His last name in, in Arab, uh, in their language, was the beast. And the, the parent, his father or grandfather, when they first got into politics, changed his last name to, to Al-Assad, which means the lion. So he's what? His name means the one who, who was a beast, who is a lion. And if you want to see and understand that this is true, go to Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, it tells you the four beasts, right? These are four great beasts. And the first, so the first beast was like a lion. The first beast is like a lion. That's, that's the definition of Assad's name. The beast that is the lion. Okay? And he's from the north. And we've seen it. I mean, all we have to do is go into 2 Chronicles 24. And you read that the Jews in their, in their pride and so forth, not following the God of their, of their fathers, they're going to be destroyed by Syria, even though Syria this time We'll have the smaller army against Jerusalem and Israel's greater army. Jerusalem will be destroyed and they will flee. That's why the Lord was telling them to flee to the mountains in Luke's discourse. And so what do we see? The lion has come up from his thicket and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Why on his way? 
because the lion comes first to destroy Jerusalem and the destroyer of the Gentiles is Russia. This is connected to the bear. They're not all attacking at the same time. It will begin with Syria and the destruction of Jerusalem. That is the true. You could say World War Three has started, right? That's what this all is. It's this buildup. It's been going on for years. But the official beginning of World War Three is the destruction of Jerusalem after the Iran-Israel battle in which Tel Aviv and Haifa is destroyed at the beginning of the 50 days, right after the pre-trib escape. So this is the lion, and that is Syria. That is the beginning of the 14 years, which will take place at the Feast of Trumpets, and it begins the Red Horse Rider nation against nation. Jerusalem is attacked from the north, which I believe would put it in October 2024. Why October 2024? Because it'll happen right in here from the year's end to the Feast of Trumpets because it's the prophetic picture of, of Ishmael. It's the prophetic picture of Syria. It's the raven, and it's all connected to the Feast of Trumpets because we know from the Feast of Trumpets six years later to the end of the first six years of tribulation, if we go to Mark 13, Mark 13 in his discourse is the seven years of seals, okay? And it begins nation against nation at the red horse rider. So we have the two and a half years of tribulation in this, which is the events that will take place of World War III as well as famine and earthquakes and, and roilings of water and all sorts of things, you see the abomination of desolation. This abomination of desolation is, there's two of them. When you understand the differences in the Gospels and realize that the tribulation is the Luke portion above seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets, that's why there's differences in the, in the synoptic Gospels. This abomination of desolation in Mark 13 is the one during seals, which will be the mark of the beast, like Revelation 13. It's being placed where it ought not be placed. Okay, It's not standing in the holy place. It's being placed where it shouldn't be placed, which is all about the mark of the beast. And what happens? You want to see where that is? That's when the about two and a half years of World War III comes to an end, because now the second beast revealed before the fourth seal just shortly before the fourth seal has people now coming to worship the first beast so now what happens the antichrist is given power to continue 42 months how do we know that the 42 months begins about two and a half years after the tribulation has begun because we just saw right here and as you grow in the understanding of it you'll realize that all of this portion here and, and the, the, the sorrows and the pain and travails being all part of World War III is the first two and a half years to bring the world to its knees, to bring all people to their knees so that they will cry out for any kind of savior to come and save them. And then what do you see? Now you're seeing the abomination of desolation. This is when... The Antichrist will now get his power to continue for 42 months. Okay? He's now got power to continue, which means he was here already. But now is when he's really given the authority to take over. And this is why in, in Mark's discourse, you don't see anything in the first half before the abomination of desolation. You see nothing about false Christs or false, false prophets. You only see about World War III and all the devastation. You see that there's going to be persecution against Christians because in the first half of tribulation, the, the first half of seals, the first two and a half years, it's going to be the greatest time of revival in the midst of absolute devastation. But World War III in tribulation is only called the beginning. The beginning. World War III as devastating as it's going to be, and it will affect the whole world this time, is only called the beginning. Why? Because at the abomination of desolation, 
when the Antichrist gets his power to continue now and really take over for the next 42 months, we see that it's going to be a time worse than it was at any point in human history until this time. And look at what you see in, now in Mark 13, 22. Now you see, for false Christs and false prophets shall rise. You see how that's laid out? Before abomination of desolation, no mention of false Christs and false prophets. Why? Because it's the two and a half years where the world is at war, where you have the lion, the bear, and the leopard, who are all in World War III, destroying Jerusalem, destroying the Gentiles in the world. The leopard, I believe, will be the control center for all of it. Well, all of this is breaking out. It's not until two and a half years later that Antichrist gets his 42 months to continue. That is the point of the abomination of desolation in Mark. And Christians will flee. They will be translated to places of protection. They will be brought to places of protection, shown places of protection, if they remain in Christ, in their faith, and being obedient. And what do we see? Bang, false Christs and false prophets show up. Until what? Mark 13, 24. And this is the point I was getting at in the last part. If it's going to start at trumpets, then six years later would be from the year's end to the start of trumpets in 2030 would be six years later, when it would be what? The day and hour that no one knows. So is it the first of Tishri or the second of Tishri? That's the day and hour that no one knows that we read about in Mark's discourse. So now he's had his 42 months of ruling and reigning as the Antichrist with the mark of the beast, and we come now to Mark 13, 24, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the son of man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So now what are you seeing here? Now you're seeing the end of the 42 months, the end of the three and a half years that the Antichrist, that the beast gets to rule and reign for those 42 months. This is what's happening here. That's why in, in the fifth seal, you see the martyrs, the killing of the Christians who refuse the mark in the fifth seal. You don't see them at the fourth seal, okay? It's not until the fifth seal that you see them under the, under the uh, altar in heaven saying, Lord, when are you going to have vengeance on us? Antichrist has three and a half years after about two and a half years, so that brings you to what? The end of the sixth seal brings you to the end of the first six years. So what happens? If it started at Feast of Trumpets, and we go to the end of six more years, we come to the Feast of Trumpets of 2030. The day and hour no one knows. So when the Lord is seen coming in this power and glory, what do we see that that is? Well, this is what most people don't understand because they haven't understood the truth is 14 years. This is why at the end of the sixth seal, which is the end of the first six years of tribulation, end of six years of seals, we see that everybody's now freaking out. In rocks and mountains fall on us, and it says in Revelation 6.16, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? This is not the Lord coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is the Lord coming at the end of six years of seals, which is Mark's discourse that we just read when they see him coming in a cloud and everybody's panicking and freaking out because he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. This is what's happening right here. And when is he coming at this point? Well, look at what it says in Mark 13, 32. But of that day and that hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. You see, this is that day and hour that no one knows. This is not all of them. It is the first one. And it comes at the end of six years 
of tribulation from when seals began. And so six years from the start of tribulation, which was Feast of Trumpets, six years later would be the Feast of Trumpets. So how fitting that Mark's discourse ends with the Lord coming on the day and hour no one knows, which is either the first or second of Tishri, depending on the, on the moon. The day and hour no one knows. Exactly relating to everything that we read here connected to chapter 6. See, the stars of heaven shall fall. <clears throat> what do we see in Revelation chapter 6? Revelation chapter 6. We saw it right here. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Hello. This is that same time frame. So now, <clears throat> what happens after the Antichrist had his 42 months? We saw that first portion of Mark's discourse had no mention of false Christs or false prophets. Not until he gets his power that and the mark of the beast comes, then you see mention of false Christs and false prophets. And so now what happens? He gets his 42 months. So when the Lord is seen at the end of the sixth seal or the end of the six years of seals, what happens to the Antichrist? The answer is found in a number of places, but the easy one is in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, remember we saw the first beast, the lion? That's the one bringing destruction on Jerusalem. Then we see the bear. That's when World War III, I mean, World War III bring in at the lion, but it's the bear that then brings it to the world. Then you have the leopard who has the dominion because they're the ones that are going to be the control center. I think somewhere in, in Europe, like Germany and, and all up in that area, they're going to be the control center for the coming beast system after World War III. And here we see the fourth beast. And what do we see? This fourth beast is the one that, the same one, you see with 10 horns? It's the same one from Revelation 13. And what do we see in Revelation 13? And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. See, the leopard was the third beast during, during the first uh, two and a half years of World War III. And his feet were as a bear. There's the bear. And his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power. So now, when the beast comes, when he gets that power to continue, and it relates to the 42 months after World War III, we see that he's given power to take control over the lion, the bear, and the leopard. Now everything is under his control, okay? And so what do we see? It says, and had iron teeth that it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had 10 horns, okay? Exactly the definition, now having control over the other three, and he has 10 horns, just as we read in Revelation 13. But look at what he does. He stamps the residue with his feet. If we go back into Luke's discourse in chapter 21, what did we read in Luke's discourse? <laughs> there it is. He always takes a little bit longer. In Luke's discourse, we read that this period of time right here, when he tells them to flee from Jerusalem and go to the mountains, when he's here as the white horse rider, when he's here, the son of man, as Jonah, he's warning them to flee to the mountains when they see they're about to be compassed about and be destroyed. How long will this continue for them? Excuse me, listen to what it says uh, in verse 21, 22. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with children and them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and carried, and shall be led captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, when you understand that the tribulation is 14 years and not seven, you'll realize that the time of the Gentiles is Mark's discourse, and the end of the Gentile age is, is the end of seals. So Antichrist is doing this treading down. This beast with that power of all three is now going to be treading it down until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, 
which is the end of the sixth year of seals. And look at what we see happen. Okay? We saw that now the Antichrist gets his power. The beast got his power. He stamps the residue with his feet. And he gets to do it until Daniel 7, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels burning uh, as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. I believe that's your pre-trib bride right there. Ten thousand times ten thousand is a hundred million. I believe it's a prophetic picture of a hundred and I believe 44 million that will be standing before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. And then we see, I beheld because of the voice uh, of the great words, which the horn spake, uh, I beheld even until the beast was slain and his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominions taken away yet their lives were prolonged for a season in time. So we're talking like Syria and Russia and Germany and all this. Those beast leaders will have their lives prolonged. But who was killed? The beast. So the beast was killed when his 42 months were over and the Lord is seen coming on heavenly Mount Zion to where he's going to receive his mid-trib great multitude rapture group that you see from uh, Mark's discourse when he's coming in the clouds. So look at what it says. Here it is. This is his coming in the clouds from Mark chapter 13, Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night visions and beheld one like the son of man did come with the clouds of heaven. You see this word with, this word with means in, okay? This word with also means in. So this in the clouds, just like it said, with Mark's discourse, um, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before, and there was given him his uh, given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. This isn't the end of tribulation. This is the end of the six years of seals into that seventh year of seals. Okay, so this is what you're seeing here. He's now come to the end, and what has he done? Antichrist was killed. Antichrist is killed. So if Antichrist is killed, what's going to happen during trumpets? Well, if we go to Revelation, you're going to see this exact battle in Revelation chapter 17. Okay, remember with the 10 horns and the 10 kings? Because he had the 10 horns. Listen to what it says. Um, Revelation 17, 12. Then the 10 horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. Remember the end of Revelation 6? Hide us and from the wrath of the lamb, from him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Only one uppercase L and one uppercase K because it's the Lamb. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Okay? He destroys them. He kills the Antichrist. So Antichrist is killed at the end of the sixth seal in that battle. And listen to what it said about the Antichrist. In Revelation 17, verse 8, it says, The beast that thou sawest was okay what does that mean was well remember he was given power to reign for 42 months this is during the time of the mark of the beast this is why mark's abomination of desolation isn't the same as matthew's because it's talking about the mark of the beast and those who are under the altar who never took his mark okay so at the end of the sixth seal or at the end of the first six years of seals He's now destroyed. His 42 months are up. There's one year left in the seventh year of seals. But it's a time of assembly. It's a picture of unleavened bread. Six days and the seventh day is an assembly to the Lord. So what now happens after he's destroyed the Antichrist? Well, this is what I'm telling you. See, this was 
the beast that was, it's the representation of his 42 months. Now he's killed, as we saw in Daniel. And there's one year left of seals. What happens during that final year of seals? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 7. And we see the 144,000 who are going to be sealed before the great multitude rapture comes in. So there was a remnant group of remnant worker bride that was here with the lamb, uh, with the son of man, the prophetic, uh, the prophet son of man, who was here warning for 40 days and remained with power and authority and understanding being given to them with Holy Ghost anointing. And they remained here during seals. Some, as we saw, would be killed. And the rest are helping bring in the great multitude rapture. They're going throughout all nations, but they're going to need help because they're not a very large group of people. And it's the 144,000 who are going to be sealed to help bring in the great multitude rapture. And what do we see? Here's the great multitude rapture. When does the great multitude rapture happen? Well, it doesn't happen right away in the seventh year of seals because the 144,000 are the ones that get sealed first. And when you understand when the great multitude rapture happens, they're a wheat harvest. They're not the same wheat harvest as the Gentile bride pre-trib was. These guys in the pre-trib are related to the winter wheat, which is harvested in mid-late summer, which again is always very late July into the earlier part of August. And the two loaves that are brought in, it's connected to the Feast of Weeks. But these guys are connected as the six days, as six years of unleavened bread and then in the seventh year is the assembly, like in the seventh day of unleavened bread, is the solemn assembly to the Lord. This is a prophetic picture of unleavened bread, six days or six years in the seventh day, seventh year. But what happens is they are the prophetic picture of what's called spring wheat. They are the spring wheat harvest. And the spring wheat, You'll have the 144,000 that are going to be sealed first in 2030 around fall. And then the great multitude rapture. This is when the spring wheat is now ready to be harvested. However, spring wheat cannot be observed until go to 2031. It cannot be observed or used until. The second day of Passover. Okay. This is why the great multitude rapture doesn't happen in the first about six months of the tribulation uh, in, in the first six months of the seventh year of seals. Okay. Antichrist is killed. The others had their dominion taken away. The lamb, the Lord is here on heavenly Mount Zion, whatever that's going to look like. But the rapture group, having seen him come, doesn't yet know when they're going to be raptured. But they've seen them coming. This is why in Mark's transfiguration story, <clears throat> you see it all in a past tense. It's only in Mark's when he says that some of them will not taste of, of death, which st that stand here, uh, which shall not taste of death till they have seen. So there's a past tense. They will have seen the kingdom come with power. And here's your transfiguration of your prophetic picture of after six days or after six years. So they're prophetically in the typology after six days or years, like unleavened bread. They will have seen them come. But they don't know when they're going. And the answer to when the great multitude happens isn't the day and hour that no one knows. Because Mark 13's day and hour that no one knows is all about the Lamb, the Lord coming at the end of the first six years of seals. It has nothing to do with the great multitude rapture. The great multitude rapture, the harvest is done when he's coming. It's, it's ready to be harvested. However, it cannot be observed for about another six months. 
And in that time, the 144,000 have been sealed and they're going to help that remnant bride group who remain during seals to bring about the people in the greatest revival in human history in the midst of chaos. They're going to now have the remnant of them that survived have the 144,000 bring in the great multitude rapture with them. This is what's happening. This is what you're seeing in Revelation chapter 7. It's, it's, a, it's the exact prophetic picture. And in fact, I'll prove it to you by going to Ezekiel 39. Because the Ezekiel 39 war is the one at the end of six years of seals. Whoops, not 29, 39. <clears throat> so if we go to 39, this war of the Gog Magog, look what happens. Now they're going to be burning weapons for seven years. People never really understand that. There's, they think they're going to be burning weapons during the, the first seven years of the millennial reign. <clears throat> Look what else it says. They're going to be burying the dead for seven months. Well, remember what I said? About six months? Or are they going to be burying the dead, cleaning up Jerusalem? And when are they going to be burying the weapons? From after the Ezekiel 39 war. So you have what? The seventh year of seals. And you have six years of trumpets. That's a total of seven years. What happens at the end of those seven years? They're going to beat their plowshares back into weapons for the final battle when the Lord returns feet down, like you read about in Zechariah chapter 14. So you see, the great multitude rapture isn't observed until the second day of Passover in the seventh year of seals. That is the time of the great multitude mid-trib rapture in Revelation chapter 7. And then we read in Revelation chapter 8, it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. So what is this silence in heaven about the space of half an hour? So you know, five or six months. If this is maybe seven months, this is maybe five months. What is this silence in heaven? I believe this is the peace that the Lord makes, the agreement that he makes, excuse me, with all nations that we read about in Daniel chapter seven. After he's come, he's defeated the enemy. Antichrist is killed. Remember what happened? Now the dominion is given unto him. This is when he makes the covenant. This is when you go to Daniel chapter 9, and why many people haven't caught this and believe it's the Antichrist. It's the Lord himself. Listen to what it says. You see, it says in 925, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, which means the Jerusalem was destroyed, Unto Messiah the Prince, this is Messiah coming, the Lamb at the end of sixth year, shall be seven weeks. Seven weeks. This means seven years, which means the temple won't start to get built until the seven years of seals are done. Because of the abominations and the, the desecration that has happened for the past 70 years in the land, it now must take a rest for seven years okay and it says then what comma and which means a separate period of time about three and a half years now the city and the streets and the wall will be built in troublous times which is the first half of trumpets and then it says in chapter 26 9 26 of daniel and after those about three and a half years so you have seven years and three and a half which is about ten and a half years puts you at about mid trumpets listen to what it says Shall Messiah be cut off? Well, we know Messiah is here because we saw him coming at the end of the sixth seal. He destroyed Antichrist. And then you had that seventh year with the 144,000 sealed. Then the great multitude rapture. And then he makes a covenant with all nations. And then the seven years of trumpets will now begin. And so who is here during the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple? Messiah is. The Lamb is here. He is going to be here with Zerubbabel 
And whoever modern day Zerubbabel is, is going to be responsible for rebuilding the temple. It's going to be Messiah, the high priest. The lamb is going to be there. And so is the modern day Zerubbabel, who will be the one to rebuild. And it's exactly what Ezekiel chapter 6 is telling us, that they will rule between the two of them. There will be both. One from the branch and the other one who's the high priest, Joshua, Yeshua Messiah, who is the one with the greater authority, who is the one directly connected to the father. Whereas the modern day Zerubbabel, the branch will be the one who will oversee in the rebuilding of the temple. When those about three and a half years are over, Messiah is cut off. So who wasn't here for this period of time? Antichrist wasn't here. Who was killed in Daniel 7? Antichrist. The beast was killed. But the false prophet wasn't. And those other beasts weren't. Was there a big battle, the Ezekiel 39 war? Yes. Millions will die. Probably even more than that. But the false prophet wasn't killed. Not yet. Only Antichrist. So out of Antichrist and false prophet, who's not here during these first three and a half years of trumpets? False prophet is there, but the Antichrist isn't there. So if we now, we'll come back to this in a second. If we now go back, <coughs> excuse me, to Revelation 17, look at what it says. Remember this in verse 8? The beast that thou sawest was. Remember what he was? He was there for the 32 months, uh, 42 months, for three and a half years to the end of the sixth seal. <clears throat> then he was killed, like Daniel 7 showed. Then you have that seventh year of the assembly, that seventh day in the time of the assembly. In that seventh seal, he's going to make a covenant now with all nations after the great multitude rapture has come in. And then what happens? Now you have the about first three and a half years of trumpets. The lamb is now on Mount Zion and the rebuilding starts as we were just reading in Daniel, which would begin then in the fall at the time of trumpets of 2031. You see? That went from the Feast of Trumpets of 2030 to the Feast of Trumpets 2031, fulfilling this one year because he came at the end of seals on the day and hour no one knows. The rapture group saw him coming but didn't know when they get to go because they won't be observed for about another six, seven months, five to seven months. And then when they come in with the help of the 144,000, then the Lord makes a covenant with all nations. And it's that about half an hour of silence in heaven, which is the peace beginning on the earth, the agreement that is made on the earth. So who's not here during the first half of trumpets? Antichrist. The Antichrist is no longer here. He was killed. And so that's why we're reading in Revelation 17, verse 8, he was and is not. You see, was is the past tense of the second half of seals. Is not is the conversation of the present tense of the first half of trumpets. So he is not because he was killed at the end of seals. And he's not there during the first half of trumpets while the city and the streets and the temple are being rebuilt. So now that the 144,000 have brought in the great multitude, Lord has made a covenant with all nations. The city and the streets are being rebuilt, even in the midst of the chaos, right? Because the first four trumpets are still being unleashed on the earth. You now have the 144,000 that you see in Revelation chapter 14, you see them here on Mount Zion with the Lamb. Now does it make sense why the 144,000 are standing on Mount Zion and they already have the Father's name written on their foreheads because they were sealed at the beginning of the seventh year of seals. Now, here they are towards the end of it and they're ready to go out. They're on Mount Zion. They're not on the Mount of Olives. 
this is the this is the stone from Daniel chapter two when he destroys the image of the beast and the ten toes are broken up and this stone becomes a great mountain. That's not the Lord coming on heavenly uh, uh, coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's him coming on Mount Zion. And now the hundred and forty four thousand are there and they're, they've already been sealed and they're standing on Mount Zion because the Lord came with heavenly Mount Zion. This is what you're seeing. It's not the Antichrist who builds the temple. And then once it's built, goes in and declares himself king, uh, uh, declares himself God. People have taken everything from seals and trumpets and mashed it all into one seven-year period because they haven't yet had the revelation of the differences of who their Gospels are speaking to and the 14 years. So this is the three and a half years of the rebuilding, the city and the streets, and the 144,000 are out preaching and evangelizing everywhere that they're going, okay? This has now brought us into what? Well, when we went now from Mark's discourse, we've now covered the Mark's discourse, and we're now going into Matthew's. We now saw with the abomination of desolation, with the Antichrist, the Antichrist, now false prophets and false Christ show up. Now you see why it's after uh, the abomination, because it's the Mark of the Beast time. Then you see the Son of Man coming on the day and hour no one knows. We know why it's the day and hour no one knows. And now trumpets is about to begin. Now it's the time of trumpets. What's going to happen? The Son of Man is here. He's going to, uh, uh, the, the Lamb, they're following the Lamb wheresoever he goes, right? The 144,000, as you read in Revelation 14, because he is the high priest who's here. While the city and the streets and the temple are being rebuilt. This is why shall uh, um, and is not. Was, is not. So what do we know this period of time is? It's about three and a half years. The one from Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9 that we were reading about. And we see all this stuff now. Them being delivered. Them being hated. And look at what you see in Matthew chapter 24. Before the abomination of desolation, which in Mark's we didn't see false Christs or false prophets, but we know at the second half there's false Christs and false prophets. But then at the end of the six years of seals, we know Antichrist is killed, so only false prophet is still around. And so look at what you see in the first half of Matthew's discourse, which is the, the, the connection to the first half of trumpets. You see only false prophets. No mention of false Christs before the abomination of desolation in Matthew's portion. Because this is the seven years now of trumpets. So only the false prophet is still kicking around. While the lamb is there on Mount Zion, the 144,000 have gone out, the city and the streets and the temple are being rebuilt. And then what happens? The abomination of desolation in Matthew chapter 24. You see how the wording is different? Stand in the holy place, not placed where it not where it ought not be. This is now stand in the holy place. Why? Because during these about three and a half first years of trumpets, the city and the streets and the temple were rebuilt, just as we were reading in Daniel chapter nine. We know that it was Zerubbabel, modern day Zerubbabel, who will oversee the rebuilding while the high priest Lord is there. With the 144,000. And what happens? There's your rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple that we know about. And then what happens? After those about three and a half years, for a total of 10 and a half years from when it began at the Feast of Trumpets in 2024, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So there's some sort of war that now takes place that will begin with a flood and it will bring it will culminate at a point with the end of a war. OK, well, if you go to Zechariah and we go to chapter eight of Zechariah, which is a prophetic picture of the Lord having returned unto Zion. 
He's in the midst of Jerusalem on holy Mount Zion. It's called the mountain of the Lord. And look at what he tells them. He tells them the foundations that were already laid because the foundation only will be laid during the midst of seals. But none of the rest will get will get taken will be built. And then it says, um, which was in the day during seals, that the foundation of the Lord, uh, uh, that the house of the Lord of hosts was laid. That the temple might be built. And he goes on in verse 10, in Zechariah 8, verse 10. For before these days, there was no hire for man, nor hire for beast. Neither was there peace. Remember the red horse rider? Neither was there peace because peace was removed to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. Well, that's exactly what the tribulation of the 14 years starts with. When Jerusalem is destroyed, peace was taken from the earth, and the Lord, through the red horse rider being released with the great sword, said everyone against his neighbor, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, which is the beginning of Mark's discourse and the start of the 14 years in 2024 at True Feast of Trumpets. So now look what happens when you go about three and a half years later in chapter 11 of Zechariah. <clears throat> We now see that the vintage of old is come down. It's a picture of Satan being cast down. And look at what it says. In Zechariah 11, verse 10, I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I may break my covenant, which I had made with all nations, and it was broken in that day. So you're seeing the same picture of when these three and a half years come to an end. And at the fifth trumpet, what do we read about at the fifth trumpet? Okay, let's go see what the fifth trumpet says. Uh, Revelation 11 or 9? <clears throat> uh, Revelation 9. Okay, at the fifth trumpet, if you go back to Revelation 8 at the end, the first four trumpets have blown, and now there are three woes, okay? The first, second, and third woe, the, the, which is the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet. It says, and the fifth angel sounded, and a star fell from heaven. And what did it have? The key to the bottomless pit. And the key to the bottomless pit was opened. And what happened with the one that comes out of the bottomless pit? Let's go to Revelation 11. When he comes out of the bottomless pit, who's coming? Well, we see all those crazy creatures and everything coming, right? Let's see what it says. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony. So the two witnesses are there for the first three and a half years of trumpets while the city and the streets are being rebuilt, right? And it says... So when they have finished those 1260 days, which is this same about three and a half year period of time to the fifth trumpet, while the city and the streets are being built, Revelation eleven seven 7 says, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So who's coming out of the bottomless pit? Satan's being cast down and the pit is being opened and the ant and, and the false prophet who is still here. So now the false prophet we saw in the first half of trumpets is still here, like Matthew 24 before the abomination. And Satan is cast down because he's now lost his battle against Michael and his angels. So if we go to Revelation 12, <laughs> we see this exact story. In Revelation 12, they finished their 1260 days. Michael and his angels defeat Dragon and his angels. Satan is now cast down. And when he's cast down, woe to the whole world, because it's going to be a time worse than it ever was. You see, at Mark's point, when it was the Antichrist and the false prophet, it was worse than it would ever have been until that time. But now we're coming to the first woe, which is the fifth trumpet, when Satan has been cast down, when Satan is cast down, the pit is open. And when the pit is open, it said the beast comes out. 
So if we go to Revelation, we go back to Revelation 17. You're now going to understand what verse 8 was telling us. The beast that thou saw was, because he was for the 42 months of the second portion of seals, and is not for the first half of trumpets, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Hello, now you getting it? <clears throat> he comes out from the bottomless pit in the second half of trumpets when Satan is cast down. So now when we go back to Matthew chapter 24, look at what it says. Remember when we were talking about how it only had false, uh, false prophets in the first half until the abomination of desolation? Look what happens after the abomination of desolation. False Christ and false prophets are back in the picture again. And what kind of time is it going to be? It's going to be a time worse than it ever was. Not like Mark said up till that time, but Matthew's is worse. It says no, nor ever shall be. Meaning it will never be this bad ever again. So not only was the Antichrist time the worst that it was in history to that point? And then you had the seventh year of seals, the gathering, and so forth. Then you have the rebuilding of the city and the streets until the fifth trumpet, which will take about three and a half years. And the two witnesses finish their testimony. And what happens at the fifth trumpet? Satan has lost his battle. So now you're talking about around spring of 2036. Give or take around Passover, I believe, in 2036, or is that 20, 2035, that Satan has been cast down, like Revelation 12, that the first woe, and it's the part of the earth where it's going to be worse than it ever will ever be, never again to this point ever again. And what did it say this point was? The abomination of desolation. In Matthew chapter 24, in the holy place. Why in the holy place now? Because the temple was rebuilt during the first three and a half years. So now when Satan is cast down, it's the first woe and the pit is opened. Antichrist is coming back. So this is why after this abomination of desolation we see here, we now have the conversation of false Christs and false prophets again. It's directly laid out like this in the discourses when you understand it goes in the end of days, Luke, Mark, Matthew. Luke's had no false Christ and no false prophets. Mark's had no false Christ, no false prophets in the first half, but at the abomination of desolation, false Christ and false prophets. At the end of the six years of seals, Antichrist is killed, but not the false prophet. You come to the first half of trumpets, only false prophet is there, not false Christ. The city and the street have now been rebuilt. It's not about the mark of the beast anymore. Now it's going into the temple because the temple was rebuilt because Satan has now been cast down. The pit is open. Antichrist has come back. And now you got false Christ and false prophets again. So now why is the second half of trumpets and Matthew's discourse even worse? Because now you've got Satan, the pit open and everything that comes out. You've got the Antichrist and the false prophet, all three of them. So what do you think has to happen here? This is why you read in Daniel chapter 9 that Messiah, it's Messiah who when he's cut off has to break his covenant like we saw in Zechariah chapter 11. He is the one breaking his covenant. And remember until the end of the war? This is the war against the two witnesses. And how does it start? It's going to start with a flood. So if we go back to Revelation chapter 12, you're going to see here in Revelation chapter 12, Satan is cast down. He's lost his battle. Him and his angels, the pit is opened. It's the first woe. It's mid trumpets time, about 10 and a half years in. And what happens? Revelation 12, 14. 
and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly that she might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished for a time comma and times comma and half a time from the face of the serpent and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood but how long is she taken to protection? One year, comma plus, two years, comma plus, half a year. One plus two plus a half. That's three and a half years. So when Satan is cast down, how many years are left in the 14 years? There's three and a half years left. So when Satan is cast down, <laughs> they're taking those that are the, the woman represented there are taken under the wings of an eagle until the end of the 14th year for the right to the end of now of all of tribulation for the final three and a half years. And when this happens, it starts with Satan going after them with a flood. Well, that was exactly what you read in Daniel chapter nine. He goes after them with a flood when the pit is open at the midpoint of trumpets when Messiah is cut off. He starts by going after them with a flood. And then what happens? Then there's a war that's going to last, but have a period of ending because, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So we go back to Revelation 11. We know that the two witnesses were doing it during the first half of trumpets. So, if we go back to 11, when they finish their 1260 days, we now see when the pit is open and Antichrist comes back, what's he going to do? He's going to make war against the two witnesses. Most people have never understood that this war <clears throat> that he makes with the two witnesses has an end and a beginning. But how long is it going to last? There's only three and a half years to the end of the 14 years. But how long does Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet, how long do they have? We know that they come back because it was, is not, and shall be. The shall be is when he comes out of the bottomless pit, and that's it right here. This takes us to mid-trumpets after the temple is built, and now Messiah is cut off. So how long is this war going to last in the final three and a half years? For that, we go back to Daniel in chapter 12. And listen to what it says. In Daniel 12, verse 7, it says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. There's no end between time and times like there was over in Revelation 12, 14. This doesn't, there's, there's no addition here, it means. It means one, two, plus a half this is a total is it's going to be for two and a half years and it says and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people all of these things shall be finished which means satan and antichrist who has come back and the false prophet being there have three and a half out of the final three and a half years they get two and a half years of the final three and a half years until what until they've scattered all the people and their power, and then it's finished. Well, how do you know when the finish is? In Revelation chapter 10, it tells us that those two and a half years are done at the seventh trumpet. Okay? Revelation 10 verse 6. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and all things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, uh, that therein are, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared it to his servants, the prophets. It's over. When is it over? At the end of the second woe. Because remember, it's two and a half years that he's going to have. Which means the two and a half years begin from springtime 
of 2035. So from the springtime now of 2035, which will be give or take around Passover time, Satan is cast down and he's now got two and a half years with the Antichrist back and it's from the first woe to the end of the second woe. The, from the beginning of the first woe to the end of the second woe is a period of two and a half years. And we can understand this <clears throat> by going to Revelation 11, which means he's going to be fighting against the two witnesses in this war and kill them at the end of the two and a half years. And how do we know how long it takes? Because the same hour after they've been killed in Revelation 11, 13, it says in the same hour, there was a great earthquake. Tenth of the city fell. Um, and in the earthquake were slain of men, 7,000. And the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the Lord God of heaven. Look at this. The second woe is past. That's the seventh trumpet. Okay. Which means from the beginning of the sixth, uh, of the fifth trumpet, the first woe to the end of the sixth trumpet in the second woe is two and a half years. Because this war against the two witnesses we just saw is two and a half years. And this second woe is the end of it when they've been killed. And how can we prove it? Because the seventh trumpet is what Revelation chapter 10 said. When the seventh trumpet, as soon as it starts to sound, when the seventh trumpet sounded, there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. This takes us to the end of the sixth woe. Which means of the final three and a half years of trumpets, there was a group taken to the very end of it that won't even be here during that final year. Why? Because Satan had two and a half of those three and a half years. But now... It's time for the enemies to pay the price in the final year. What is this final year? This final year is called the day of the Lord and the year of his wrath. It is the day of the Lord and the year of his wrath. What day is it? We have it at the great earthquake, the Feast of Trumpets, 2037. Remember, if it started at Feast of Trumpets and the end of six years was Mark's day and hour, no one knows. You had the one year, which means it began at the Feast of Trumpets in 2031 of the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple. When the six years of trumpets now come to an end, <laughs> it should be the Feast of Trumpets. If Messiah was cut off and then he's returning at the end of that second woe to start that seventh year of trumpet, uh, that seventh year of trumpet judgments, it should be the Feast of Trumpets. Well, if you go to Matthew chapter 24, look at what it says. Matthew chapter 24, there's your cutting off when Messiah is cut off. And then it says, there's your false Christ and false prophets. And then look at what it says. Immediately after. Remember, it's going to be immediately after, as soon as it's over. There's of that second woe is over then the, and the seventh trumpet for that seventh year begins to sound immediately after the tribulation of those days they're going to see the sign of them okay here he comes the sign of the son of man in heaven and all the tribes you see now it's talking about the tribes okay and what do we see shall see the son of man coming in the clouds it sounds like marks but it's not because this word for in actually is the word on because this is when he's seen coming on the clouds and the whole world will see him and what is it and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet what did we see in the seventh trumpet when the sixth woe was done immediately after that the seventh trumpet begins to sound the mystery is over it's the son of man coming on the clouds as lightning from one end unto the other and what does it say? But of that day and hour knows no man. So that means 
It's going to be at the Feast of Trumpets after Satan has had his two and a half years. It would be the Feast of Trumpets in 2037. So Satan has his two and a half years. Now brings us to the Feast of Trumpets of 2037. <clears throat> at the time of the day and hour that no one knows. When the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and it is the end of the two and a half years that Satan had when he goes in with the Antichrist who declares himself God, right? Which is exactly what you read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 when he comes what? From the pit, when he is the son of perdition. We were told in Revelation 17 that the son of perdition is when he comes from the pit. And he's going to go what? Into the temple. Because that is the second half. That is the second seven years. And it's the one when the actual temple will have been rebuilt. This is when all three of them are here. And why Matthew's time says it'll be worse than ever and never again worse than this from this time. Do you know that at the point when Messiah is cut off in Zechariah 11, Listen to what it even says when he has to break his covenant. Listen to what it says is going to happen. Um, in verse 16, it says, For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off. Neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces it's craziness you even read more about it uh where was it further up this one right here in verse nine so when he has to cut off it when he breaks his covenant right it said in uh zechariah 11 verse 9 then said i i will not feed you that that dieth let it die that that is cut off let it be cut off and let the rest eat every one the flesh of another what? That is this point right here. Mid trumpets. Mid trumpets. At the fifth trumpet, when Satan is cast down, having lost. Could you imagine life on earth? Satan cast down with his angels. The pit opened. Antichrist and all of those beasts coming out of the pit. And you've got to be here on the earth for two and a half years of that? You think your life is bad now. You think you think from mid-seals with Antichrist is bad. And he says it's going to be bad than it ever was to that point. This point, he says it's going to be worse than all of human history, even beyond what it was here. But it'll never be that bad ever again. And it will last for two and a half years. So what happens at the end of the two and a half years? Well, that will have been a total of 13 years which means there is one year left and it begins at the Feast of Trumpets 2037. That Feast of Trumpets 2037 is now when the Lord, if you go to uh, Daniel, we saw in uh, Matthew 24, we saw him now coming, okay? So when he comes at the Feast of Trumpets, that's him returning there, feet down on the Mount of Olives as lightning, from one end unto the other. And if we go to Daniel chapter 9, this is what we're seeing here in the final verse in verse 27. Now are you following how it's 14 years? Seven years is seven weeks is seven years. This 30, uh, uh, three score in two weeks is about three and a half years for a total of 10 and a half. When this total of ten and a half of which Messiah was here during the first three and a half years of trumpets, he is now cut off. And the people of the prince that shall come destroy the city and the sanctuary. Then there's the flood. Because Satan's been cast down, the pit has been opened. He goes after them with the flood. And they're taken away to a place protected till the end of the 14 years. They're gone for three and a half years. But then there's a war that breaks out against the two witnesses that lasts for two and a half years to the end of the second woe or the sixth trumpet. And then what's left? I just showed you there was one year. 
which is called like Isaiah and others talk about it, which is the day of the Lord and the year of his wrath. And Daniel 9, 27 leaves us with what? One week, which is represented by the week of years. So what do you have? Seven, about three and a half, two and a half, and one for a total of 14 years. Listen to what it says in 927 of Daniel. And he shall confirm the covenant. So what covenant is he confirming? He's now confirming the covenant that he had to break at mid trumpets that he started at the beginning of trumpets or at the very end of seals in that half an hour of silence in heaven. This is the covenant that he made. This is the Daniel 927, the covenant that he made that he had to break because Satan was cast down and he was cut off. Now he's coming back at the end of the two and a half years. He's going to destroy Satan and all the enemies, bind them for a thousand years. And what does he do? He's going to confirm the covenant. He's going to renew the covenant that he made at the beginning of trumpets, cut off at mid trumpets. And at the final year, during the final 14th year, the year of his vengeance, he's going to renew the covenant. It is the Lord. It is not Antichrist. Listen to what it says. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. What sacrifice in the oblation? The one that Satan and the Antichrist and false prophet were doing in the temple. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. You see, who was causing the overspreading of abominations? Satan, the Antichrist, who came back in the false prophet. So he's going to put an end to it, even to the pouring out of the judgment of bulls that is going to fall upon this group now. This is Zechariah chapter 14. You see, 14 chapters. That's now what? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is called what? The year of his vengeance. And what do we see? In chapter 4, I mean in verse 4 of chapter 14, he is now returned, feet down on the Mount of Olives. And he's going to bring destruction against them, right? He's going to bring destruction that their flesh is going to consume away where they stand. I mean, it's going to be absolutely devastation. And what is it? It's Revelation chapter 19. It's the, it's the final, it's the wrath of the Lord. And listen to what it says in, in uh, starting in verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Because it's what? At the time of trumpets is the time of the grapes and the harvest of the grapes. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Notice how it's all uppercase this time. Yet in Revelation 17, it wasn't the one at the end of seals. It wasn't all uppercase. This one is all uppercase because now this is the wrath of almighty God. End of, of six year of seals was the wrath of the lamb. This happens in the final year. This final woe is the wrath of the Lord God. When we go to Revelation 11 and we see what that seventh trumpet is. It even tells you. Listen to what it says. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. In verse 11, uh, in verse 17, saying, Give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which was, which art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. Now listen to verse 18. And the nations were angry. Remember, now he's coming to fight against the nations in that final 14th year. And thy wrath is come. It's the final 14th year. He's now going against the nations in the wrath, in the grape wine press of God. And it is the wrath of who? Of the Lord God Almighty. It is the final 14th year. This is why it is time and times and half a time in Revelation 14. Because there's a group protected, taken out of the way until the end of the final year when he pours out wrath 
upon all the nations that came against him that were with Antichrist, Satan, and the false prophet. And look at what happens in Revelation 19 after this battle of the final year. We see that the great battle, and listen to what it says. In this battle, look what happens. Okay? It says, we know that uh, um, in this great battle, Captain Bonds, verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on his horse and against his army. And listen to this. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that brought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and then that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. The rest were slain by the sword. So when do the Antichrist and false prophet now be taken away for good? They're taken away for good at the end of their final two and a half years with Satan, right at the beginning, at this battle, the Lord is going to cast them both alive into the lake of fire. They are now gone forever. And what happens? Satan now gets bound, right? The rest, everybody else was now killed that, would, that came against the fight. And Satan is now bound to the bottomless pit. You see, Satan isn't yet put into the lake of fire. He is bound for a thousand years. This takes you to the end of the 14 years. The, two, the Antichrist and false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire alive. Satan is bound in this final war of one year that breaks out. And then Satan is now bound for the thousand years, right here, for the millennial reign, he is bound. And what happens when that final year is over? What happens at the end of the 14 years? Well, the last, these two sevens of the 14 years, seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets, are the end of the cycle of sevens to the final jubilee. Right? It's seven years, seven years, seven years, seven times seven years. This is the second last seven years, and this is the final seven years. When this final seven years of the 14 is done, it's the end of the 14 years or the end of 49 years. And when it's over, it's the final jubilee. So those who were taken away into the wilderness for the final three and a half years to when the 14 years is over, it now begins the jubilee in year one of the millennial reign. What happens now when they're brought back? Well, let us go have a look at Ezekiel, <clears throat> the end of Ezekiel 47 and into 48. You see, here's the Lord, <clears throat> the temple. The earth is going to be renewed. When the earth is renewed after this battle, people will now be living long again like they did in the beginning. This is what um, uh, Isaiah, uh, uh, Isaiah uh, 61 talks about, that uh, someone dying at 100 would be like a child because they will live again in the original creation having been restored to as it was in the days of Noah, Okay, in the days of Adam and Eve. It's going to be restored. And this is a picture of him restoring everything. And what do we see in the division of the land portions? This is all of them coming to receive their portion. It will start with Joseph and his two sons, their two portions. And then what do you see in, Zach, in Ezekiel 48? Then you see the rest of the tribes, Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, okay, the, the two portions. You have Reuben, Judah. You're seeing all of them return to their promise. This is the promise that they were given would take place, which was their millennial reign when they will have their peace on earth and their promised portion of that period. Who is going to be here also 
ruling and reigning with the Lord during that thousand years, that first group that I said was with the Lord, that was connected, that was with the Lord during that time, during his 40 days as prophet and warning, and they're going to put their necks on the line. Here they are right here. It's not everybody that died during seals, not having taken the mark. It's those who were his remnant worker to bring in the great multitude rapture. They're the ones who remained and worked during seals to bring in the great multitude that the 144,000 then in that final year helped them bring in. And those who were dead, listen to what it says. Okay, They never took the mark, never did any of this. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So only that group, outside of all of those who had the promise in ancient times, who will be resurrected, as Daniel was told in chapter 12, will be the ones allowed to come back as well, will be resurrected. Remember, Daniel chapter 12, the last verse, he was told to stand in his plot until the last day. He's going to stand, he's going to, sorry, lie in his plot and would be resurrected at the last day. He is going to take part in the resurrection. But so are the seals workers who put their necks on the line and they will have part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. And they're going to be priests and reign with Christ for the thousand years. This is them. And then all the others that were promised their portion and their peace on earth which is the millennial reign promise of for all the jews you see now to end it out if we go back into matthew chapter 24 we saw that it started with a gentile wedding but we know it all ends with a jewish wedding we saw that the son of man is coming at the day and hour that no one knows it'll be feet down on the mount of olives we've shown that it will be September of 2037, but there's that one year, right? Well, what do we see only in Matthew? That it would be as it was in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, we know that it lasted one year and 10 days long. Why did it last one year and 10 days? Because only in the 49th year, which this final year is the 49th year, this is while he's here as it was in the days of Noah. It represents the final year, the 49th year of the 49 before the Jubilee. And in a 49th year only, is it a year and 10 days long? And in the story of Noah, the story is a year and 10 days long. That's why it's in Matthew chapter 24, as it was in the days of Noah, which means the days of Noah and the flood and all that chaos is that final year and the destruction and the renewal and everything else. So when that final year is over, and if that final year of days of Noah are over, we now go into 2038, and you go to 2038, you come to the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, right? Which is that end of that year. But what happens? There's 10 more days. So it's a year... And 10 days, which brings them to Yom Kippur, to the atonement. And what are they given? They're going to be given white robes. What are they being given white robes for? The Jewish wedding. That is the seven days of tabernacles. Why? Well, trumpets is a full seven years with tribulation. It is the eighth day or the eighth year which is year one the jubilee the first year of the millennial reign that is the jubilee year the eighth day so what is the picture of the trumpet judgments it's the seven days as seven years of tabernacles you'll notice that seals the seventh day as seventh year was the assembly to the lord in trumpets or the seven days as seven years for tabernacles, the assembly to the Lord is the eighth day, which is the final jubilee called the new beginning. You're following? And how does it start? Well, if the final year 
is the days of Noah, and it's one year and 10 days long. And it's the 49th year, which is one year and 10 days long. And at atonement, they're being given white robes. When they receive those white robes, it's the wedding that's coming, which will be what? The seven days of tabernacle. And the eighth day is the new beginning and the jubilee and the millennial reign that's beginning. Hello. You're following it? So now what happens if you go to the rest of Matthew's discourse into Matthew 25, you have now the kingdom of heaven, which isn't for the Gentiles, it's for the Jews. And what do we see? The story of the foolish and wise virgins. It's the story of the bridegroom coming when that year is over. When that final year is over, the door will be shut to the wedding. And what do we read about? We end up reading about this picture of the seven-day wedding in Matthew 25. But we, we read, I think it's in, in Matthew 22 or something like that, about the wedding. And we know that those who come in that don't have a white robe, what happens if they come in without the white robe? They weren't invited. And when they weren't invited, they're cast out to the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And there's your final judgment when it's all over. He separates them. You see? And there's your weeping and gnashing of teeth like the unprofitable servant. Like the five of the, of the bridal wedding that is the post-trib after the final 14th year. It's the literal wedding that's going to take place. If next year begins at all, it'll be October of 2038, the actual Hebrew Jewish wedding at the time of tabernacles and the eighth day, Shmini Aretz is going to be the eighth day new beginning in the midst of the Jubilee year and the start of the millennial reign. Brothers and sisters, it is all laid out for you right here with years and everything on this timeline chart. You can find a little more detail as well in here. Please rewind it. Rewatch it as many times as you need. Download the info under the video. Um, um, come join us in the forum. Ask questions. Whatever you need, come and seek us. Rewatch it. Pray over it. Follow it throughout Scripture. Because this is the revelation of the end of days. I pray it blesses you. I pray it blesses all who are watching from the beginning of the first half of the video. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.